Good evening and welcome to El Oso Fumar Takes. This is our 178th take. Live from the Alec Bradley Lone Star Studios of Euless, Texas, I'm your host, Barry Duplissy, as always, and I'm so proud, so pleased, and so privileged to be with you all tonight. This is going to be a fantastic show. Yes, we're getting a little bit of a late kickoff, but good things come to those who wait. So we won't keep you too much waiting longer. So without further ado, before I get to introductions, let's thank the people that make this show possible. And that, of course, is our sponsors. Tonight's show is sponsored by Drew Estate. This year marks the 25th anniversary of Drew Estate and the rebirth of Cigars Movement. To celebrate this momentous occasion, the company is inviting you consumers, retailers, and cigar media alike to its epic blowout birthday bash entitled DE25. DE25 will be held on the 25th of September at South Fork Ranch Ranch in Parker, Texas, part of the Dallas-Fort Worth metro area. Yeah, just a stone's throw away from this very spot that I'm sitting right here. It's going to be a moment you would not want to forget. The DE25 celebration will include the unveiling of Drew Estate's newest brands with a first-to-experience approach for consumers and trade partners alike. Buy your tickets today at DrewEstate.com slash DE25, DrewEstate.com slash DE25, and I'll see you there. So without further ado, let's get to the introductions for our 178th take. Please, everyone, welcome my guest this evening, sponsored by United Cigars, Smoke One Today, and Start Living United, Mr. Mickey Pegg of All Saints Cigars. Mickey, how are we doing tonight? Doing great. Thanks for having me on the show. Oh, fantastic! I'm 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 so excited that you're here, and I'm so uh, I'm so glad that you agreed to be on my show uh, tonight. Even though you found out how late it was going to be, I know that was a I know that was a shocker for you. So yeah. I, I appreciate <laughs> I appreciate you to uh, making the sacrifice. And uh, I thank all my guests. I realize I do it. I usually at the end of the show, but I'll do it at the be- for you, Mickey. I'm going to do it at the beginning and the end. I realize this. Why well, you afraid I'm going to fall asleep? What's that? You're, you're afraid I'm going to fall asleep? No, I just I, I'm I'm really I'm really I'm really glad and uh, and full of gratitude that you're here today. Um, it really it. really means a lot. And you're I awesome. listen. I know I know uh, I know Sunday is family time, and um, and I I know family is very important to you, uh, as it is to me as well. And and so uh, when it's you know when you take co- you know a couple hours away from them to to spend a couple hours just talking to me about you know whatever uh, you know it, it certainly means the world to me. So thank you so much. Yeah. So, but, uh, <laughs> well, I do, I do have kind of a, I do have a kind of a fun question before we kind of get into what we're smoking tonight. In fact, I'm going to let you, yeah. uh, pick, you pick my cigar. I'm really excited to, to light one of the all saints cigars up tonight. But, um, um, so I listen, I, you know, normally when I'm not sweating my butt off here in my, my studio here in Texas, because it's, you know, it might be raining outside, but it's still like a hundred degrees in my garage. Um, I, I, and I, when I get on and put on my Sunday best, I, I like to rock the bow tie and I know you're, a, I know you're a bow tie fan too, but I, I mean, I saw you at the, at the, at the trade show and I've seen you some picks since man, the, 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 the bow tie seems to have vanished in, in a few months from, from years past. Uh, have you, have you gotten rid of it or is it just, is it kind of in hibernation? No pun intended here. Uh, you know, it's, it's funny. They're, they're, they're uh, still on the back of my door. I still have an extensive collection. Uh, but getting back in and spending so much time down in the factories and, uh, and then of course now everybody's wearing a bow tie, uh, uh, you know, Glenn loop, uh, I see the Ashton rep down in you know, mid Atlantic, great guys wearing the bow tie. Uh, it's, uh, it's not gone away. It's just that it's, um, uh, I don't, I don't, I don't know. It's, it's, it's there and I'll wear it sometimes, but uh, it's right now it's just, uh, it's, it, I'm comfortable. So. Would you say it's like was it the trademark of the pre All Saints Mickey and now you're like, yeah. now you're gonna have the the trademark of the All Saints Mickey whatever it is? Yeah, so yeah, it, you know we're constantly working on our image and and what the point we're getting across and what we're trying to do. But uh, the bow tie, yeah, it was it was a different time. It was a different era. Uh, it was a different table, as they would say in poker. Um, and uh, it's not totally gone, but uh, you know I still wear the sport coats and stuff like that. It's um, but uh, yeah, I don't know. I don't have an answer. I don't know why I haven't been wearing them lately. Um, but it, that, that's where I'm at. I'm such a fan of him. I just took note of it. And I was just like, I was like, man, I was like, he looks, he looks great. And any time there's a fellow bow tie person out there, I, yeah, I usually, I tend to bond with them whether they want so to when or you not. wear a bow tie how do they see it to the beard that's a good like, question that's have, a good like, point opening of the beard and like that, hey that's another work. thing my my uh so I you know 
my my wife asks the same thing all the time. She's like, well, why do you even wear a tie or what do you, I'm like, that's a really good question. A lot of people didn't realize this at the trade show. Like, I'm not kidding. I'm not even, I'm not even messing around. I had a mask almost the entire time underneath, like just resting around my neck right. and nobody could see it. Um, and then like, it, it was like after the trade show, when we were walking through like the, 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 the huge casino floor with, you know, 10 gazillion people, I would throw it on and I was right. walking with somebody and I pulled it up and they're like, where'd you, where'd you get that thing? I was like, Oh, it's been underneath my beard this whole time. And they're like, are you fucking kidding me? <laughs> you know, the beautiful thing about a bow tie is too, is like, I tend to, when I go out for the day, like I know there's some guys that change for every, for every part of the day, but I, well, I pick an outfit for the day because you work in 12, 14 hours. Uh, let's not call it working. We're we're doing what we what we love to do. Mm-hmm. I don't have time. I'm too hyper to even uh, to change. Uh, matter of fact, it was so crazy with my old sales reps in the day, and that's Miguel Shadell. Like, you got to tell me to stop for lunch. I'm not going to say no. You got to tell. Like, I'm hyper. Like, I'm always. I don't want to miss anything. But when you work those long days and you're selling down a lot, you take your bow tie off. If you fold it correctly, you put it in your pocket, and it looks like a kerchief in, in your pocket of your suit. And it's easy when you take it off. It's easy. You don't have that big, long Windsor tie that you have to stuff somewhere. Right. And it usually kind of matches. So that was always, I always like to be as utilitarian as I possibly can when I, when I wear stuff or do stuff or make stuff. So. Well, that's awesome. Well, like, well, I, I hope, I hope it hasn't gone forever, but I'm, I'm eager to find out what the new, the new, the new trademark is. Like you said, your, your guys are ele- ever developing. So uh the the image and everything but uh this has been a really great start for you guys and i know we're going to get into it tonight so let's get started with the cigars here i've got four cigars here from you mickey that you get you actually handed me yourself so i'm really excited to light one up with you uh so i've got the dedication um the the uh um, the maduro this one that's got the uh, full dress band on it that's not a trace wrapper that's our original release and then um i also have the um St. Francis, that's the same, be- the St. Francis Colorado and the St. Francis Maduro uh, yep. as well. And then I've also, uh, don't have the Solamente, but from what I understand, that was a, that was actually, uh, yeah, we're, 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 that's almost done. Yeah. Um, but, but if you see the one that says dedication on it, that one is, that is what we're calling the Habano. Okay. So I would smoke that. That's what I'm smoking right now. Perfect. Perfect. And um, Let's well, do it. that cigar is very similar to the dedication blend. Uh, the percentages are different on the inside. The big difference is we're not using a San Andres wrapper on it, and we're using a Habano from Ecuador wrapper on it. Okay. So um, the, the bands and all that stuff, the, the artwork has been completed. Word is finishing the packaging and getting that stuff. The cigars have been aging. Um, and they asked Parate down in Tavacusa, Esteli. And that's why we could, we wanted you to, at least from a tasting profile, we felt very confident for you uh, to have it. And obviously the retailers to smoke it. Uh, we were quite frankly embarrassed. The fact that we didn't have uh, the trade dressing for you is we, which we would like to have had. But it was important to get it into your hands and smoke it um, simply because, you know, we, we were out there with one brand, uh, you know, one line of cigars. And when you now I love to do rail smokes, that'd be a great one. If you rail smoke that next to the dedication, dedication, uh, you, you'll notice there's quite a few differences. There's okay. a lot of similarities in it. Um, and quite frankly, uh, we were. um playing with trademarks a little bit so that's why so you'll see uh, it'll be double banded well it will look double banded but it'll be one band okay um and it will be predominantly habano will be the name on the second band with dedication smaller print right under it okay so. terrific well so I mean, at the so I know, like you said, there's some tweaks and everything. But on the on the on the thirty thousand foot level, like you said, if it's if it's like the dedication original blend with a Habano Ecuador and Habano wrapper, but just some differences in the filler. So at a thirty thousand foot level too, it's very similar. I get in terms of makeup, I guess it, it's pretty comparable to the Solamente too. Yeah, but, like the Jalapa percentage, I didn't change. So I mean, I don't really disclose everything that's in there. 
but it's pretty distinct. It, it, like, like you know, you remember smoking your first Cameroon, whether you liked it or not? Yeah. Uh, um, yeah, you, you knew that you knew there was something different, whether you knew Cameroon or not, or, you know, in the beginning of smoking, you know, I started in retail and I remember that was my first like, wow, like what is tobacco? What's the influence? What's what, what's in there? Um, yeah, one of the things I think predominantly is, and I can say that confidently because I don't like to, I don't want to put words in anybody's mouth because everybody has a different interpretation, even on strength, body, flavor, is definitely, you should taste some of the jalapa that's in there. You know, I, I, I do, I do get some of that, that's, that sweet Nicaraguan flavor yeah. that's really indicative of jalapa. And I know you're a really big fan of it too, uh, the tobacco. Um, I get in trouble for that with it from everybody. Yeah. <laughs> Well, when again, I go down there, Mika's like, Miki, Miki, there's other tobaccos besides Jalapa. And it's like my wife always says, you know, like when I'm coming up with the color combinations, she goes, you know, there's other colors besides red and blue. And I go, what, khaki, forest green? <laughs> <laughs> things, like, things, you know, things that go with red and blue, right? I mean, compliment, right. complementary colors. Yeah. I'm this. I'm the same way. My my uh, my two favorite colors are really are really polarizing because they're Christmas colors. It's green and red, so I really yeah. can't wear them together except for once a year. Um, and you would think that would make me like this mega Christmas fan, like that's like over the top people, like some you know those right. people. Yeah. Um, my wife is my is daughters. Very... Yeah, my daughters are like that. You know, I'm, my... you know, they're counting down all the time. We just had yeah. Christmas in July on the 25th, right? <laughs> yeah. My my wife is my wife is like that and uh, a huge Christmas fan. And while I'm not like, I'm not like anti-Christmas or anything, I just, uh, I'm just not one of those like people that are like, ooh, like Halloween's here, start playing the Christmas music. I'm like, right. just, just not, just not me necessarily. But, uh, but no, I'm, um, I'm, I've got the first couple of puffs of this and I'm really excited to, uh, to kind of go down this journey with you. Now you said to go ahead and smoke it along with the uh, other, the original dedication you said? Yeah, I'm not going to do it tonight, uh, but you, I, I would recommend for you to do that. I, okay. Absolutely. Okay, sounds good. You great. know, one of the things that we did, you know, years ago when I was on the blending team with Tim Osgner and obviously John Huber and those guys is we would actually even take the same cigar at different humidity levels. Not that we Ooh. had control of the humidity level. Once it went out to market, we tried to enough with uh, Boveda. They were Humidipac. That was their name at the time. Mm -hmm. That's why we put them. Uh-oh, what did I just do? Can you see me? I can see you just fine. Um, uh, probably close the window mickey so that's all all right well i'm not gonna I, I can't see you i'm not gonna mess with anything um so yeah so you know we would rail smoke and also when you get down to uh, i love doing rail smokes um it, it just when you get down to like a final blend and you think that's great and then you step aside and you go back to another blend that you're working on for a specific cigar line, it's like, uh, okay, that's a great blend. And then you smoke it next to another one. You're like, oh, well, that blend's even better. You know, so you know, there's a lot of, it's like these athletes watching the Olympic, right? Mm -hmm. they're like, they're freaking phenomenal. And then somebody comes in and they're, they're just a little bit better, like the diving. Like some of these dives I was watching earlier today uh, did a fantastic job. And normally would win the gold, but didn't the girl from America got beat by the Chinese girl because, but her precision was just so much tighter and better and won. So that happens in cigars as well. Yeah, I, I, to I totally see that sometimes where uh, I, 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 man, I got to try that practice some point, trying different cigars at different humidity levels. I mean, I kind of do that now when I do some, I have some, I have, I, I, I'm a huge aging nerd as my audience knows. And so, like, I, I do have certain humidors that are at certain levels. Right. Um, but uh, but that would be cool to do the same cigar at different humidity levels. That would be, like, at the same time. Like, that would be this, really cool. This is absolutely crazy. Killing me. How did I lose? I'm in Zoom. Do you want to have launch? Don't see your Zoom meeting. If I'm, uh, I'm going to take a rest here. Don't get mad at me. Okay. Well, no problem. Uh, no. Open Zoom meeting. I don't know what I did. Well, I'm just going to have to trust. 
Well, like, well, like I, see, I, I like seeing your beautiful face when I'm talking to you. I, I, I feel the same way. I'm, I'm sorry. I'm sorry about that. But uh, no, like I said, you probably just minimize the window or something, or I'm, or like you put something in front of it. Are you on a Mac or a PC? Uh, I don't know. What I'm, I'm on my wife's computer because we couldn't get on it with mine with my Mac. Okay. So, but I'm afraid to touch a button after all this crap we went through. Oh, uh, it's okay. All good. All righty. Well, um, well, in, Mickey, let's go ahead and jump into uh, – well, we kind of figured that out. Let's go ahead and jump into our, our major point. And w tonight we welcome um, our newest sponsor, uh, sponsoring the major point tonight, which is uh, Protocol Cigars, Power of the P. Tonight's major point is brought to you by the people – by the people, cigar people, the people who know everything about a lifetime of service. Protocol Cigars is more than just pool parties and good times. Well, maybe it is. But behind the fun is a motivation for service, a motivation for giving back from the original Protocol Blue to the latest release in the Lawman series, Bass Reeves. Protocol has always been about honor, passion, and yes, the people. It's what their life's work has been and always will be. Power of the P, Protocol Cigars. So, Mickey. Um, I love Wani. I love Wani. I love who doesn't love, who doesn't love Wani? Seriously. Hey, like, they're just right up the street from me. I live in Havertown, right outside of uh, Philadelphia. And they are right up, right up, well, I say right up the street, right up like uh, 476 on, on a, on the top of, above what they call the blue route here. So I was just up seeing him. I saw Juan at the show, Kevin at the show. Great guys. I actually did a show with, uh, with John, uh, Johnny on cut and, and with Kevin. It was, a, it was a lot of fun. We did it up in Lena's shop up in um, Tobacco Village. So John, Johnny smokes, man. Yeah, it's a good show. It's a lot of fun. They, they That's the guy that doesn't sleep. That son of a bitch. Yeah, I um, I I feel like I feel like a lot of guys in the cigar industry and gals too, for that matter, don't sleep. Like, you don't. I mean, you're you're. I think that's one of the things that makes it so uh, you can get on at any time and get on the conversation. And uh, whether you're a manufacturer, or whether you're or when I say manufacturer, brand owner, I, I think you know where I'm what I'm saying. Um, or a consumer that's uh, you know, it's funny because when I when I reposted your thing, I said, cigars never sleep. It was a, it was a play on what, I guess, what was that wall street or whatever, but um, yeah, just, you know, people work three shifts. Um, you know, you got Kevin, the commission up in New York who works in a hospital and he's either active at three o'clock in the morning or three o'clock in the afternoon, depending on what his shift was. Well, I get, I mean, I get text messages from Coop like at like three o'clock in the morning sometimes. Well, that guy never, I mean, come on. That yeah. guy's a freaking machine. He really is. It's really awesome. Um, so, but, I mean, but you, I mean, speaking of, I mean, speaking of machines and speaking of, you know, journeys and everything like that, I mean, you, like we were talking a little about a little before we try to get this, this, uh, the zoom to cooperate a little bit. We were, uh, we were talking a little bit about yours as well. And uh, I mean, that's, that's something that, you know, is pretty epic i mean it's it's kind of worthy like i even kind of joked around in my part my uh, my post about it i was like i mean it's worthy of i mean it's worthy of the iliad man i mean it's kind of it's kind of homer-esque <laughs> which is funny because i used to refer to that when i worked at cio because uh you know they were turkish armenian so we had a lot of you know and they had a cigar called the odyssey right that's right oh goodness oh man that's taking it back yeah. that's taking it back so so i mean so let's talk before we kind of kick off your career and everything. Uh, I know you're I, I, what I've heard the reputation that precedes you. Oh, is boy. it your, is oh, it your, boy. no, 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 nothing, nothing, nothing ostentatious. Just you're, you're a man of stories. You know, you've, you've had, you've had an illustrious career in scars and you know, you've, you've probably touched or talked to or spoken with or have had a relationship with a lot of people in this business that are, you know, have had some success and you probably knew them when they were first starting out, which is pretty cool. Yeah, to see, absolutely. To see them. So, uh, um, so I mean, I'm kind of giving you free reign here. I know this is kind of like, like, you know, just kind of open table, but um, like, what was, you know, what, what's one of your favorite stories to share about what's like, let's, I'll narrow it down for you. Yeah. As far as someone who's like really prominent now in the cigar industry, but you like, you met them literally on day one and you're like, you knew that they were going places. I pick one. Uh, yeah. There's uh Let's see, uh, Lita was just getting out of the jewelry business and, and it was called Los Diplomaticos before he bought the farm. I bought, literally bought the farm, not bought the farm, but bought the farm. Right, right. Uh, the Finca. Um, 
there was Ho, uh, there was uh, George or Jorge Padron get, just getting out of his MBA at, uh, at Miami after going to FSU, which was pretty funny. He did undergrad at FSU and they got his MBA from Miami and helping his dad take that to the next level and, and introduce the Anniversario series. Uh, Rocky just getting started, uh, Tony Brahani, uh, who, uh, okay. Let's really see, let's has- talk about Tony real quick. Okay. Let's talk yeah. about Tony. Cause okay. So yeah, I mean, baby. Yeah, baby. Let's everyone, talk about everyone, Tony. Beats around, everyone kind of beats everyone. Like everyone talks about this. I mean, when Tony Bahani's name is mentioned, it's, it's almost mentioned with this, this, this almost this auspicious whisper. But, you know, like Tony, oh, Tony, but like this, ah, oh, Tony, like Tony, because he was, I mean, he had some of the most hottest cigars on the market. I mean, he was, I mean, he was the cat's pajamas. I mean, everyone, I remember when I first started smoking, I caught like the, the back end a little bit of it. Well, actually, I was kind of right in the middle, I suppose, of, of his, you know, of his run and everything and, and made some stupendous cigars. I mean, amazing. And, and I mean, he's you know he's not you know he's not around anymore it's just it kind of fizzled out and everything you know what what was i guess what was was his strength yeah what was the yeah what was the what was the best part about knowing tony in that in that run uh let's say let's see let's um come on i went to mass today because i don't want to say anything bad um i have a lot of good things to say about tony but there's a lot of things that unfortunately just disrupted his his momentum but um number one he was just always upbeat and positive um he did he was one of the first people you know they say outside the box and i hate all these freaking terms outside the box at the end of the day and if i say him then slap me uh all <laughs> these all these things but you know, like he, he was working out of costa rica at the cheese baron's place he was working with tobacco so that other people weren't working with or admitting to and that correlates to another story of my life you know at cao but um uh and, and just just had a lot of high energy um and you know and just like made you look was, calm and high energy or was like on your level because like you're pretty high you're pretty high energy every yeah energy. well i was a lot crazier back in the day so you know tim wong or some of these other guys will tell you too uh showed out and i was intense too like i wasn't you know a lot of people always, oh, always smiling, but you know, behind behind the closed doors, sometimes I could be a little intensive. You didn't know the blend, you didn't know the cigar. When I say the blend, wrapper, filler, binder, that's all you needed to know. You know what I mean? So, uh, country of origin, not not the specifics, not whether it's Creole '98 or Jalapa, whatever, and other price points. And I got a funny story about Miguel. I can tell you a little bit later about that when I interviewed him. Um, but it was, you know, he just had high energy and and it just. Uh, and really came up with some blends that were unique and and explosive because everything was kind of the same, you know, at that point. Uh, but also people were starting to learn from the retail. I was in retail at the time when I met a lot of these people at Georgetown Tobacco in Washington, D.C. So, uh, yeah, so he, he just had a lot and just, um, you know, unfortunately didn't change with the formats and then had other things that got in the way and that, that was it. But then you have guys like Rocky Patel, who I, you know, obviously who I work with now, had that high energy and just kept getting better and like wasn't afraid to make a mistake or, or, or trip and get back up and get on it again and go after it and, you know, acclimate to, uh, to the industry, to whatever he needed to do. And then, you know, eventually within, you know, yeah, Rocky was an overnight success, but over after 25 years, you know, and mm-hmm. uh, he, you know, he would fall down and he'd get right back up again. He got back up on that horse and did uh, those other things. And I, I think, unfortunately, that uh, that hindered Tony a little bit. So and then um, and there was other things that happened. But, you know, outside of that, you know, if you look at the positive things and that's where you want to emulate when you look at something and you're building, whether you're building a brand or creating a brand and building it. I built brands before. This is the first time that I've been in the creation of a brand and then building it. It's uh, and it's a lot different. I've talked about that before. You know, um, when I got my hands on a couple of the other brands, there was already some kind of foundation there. Um, so yeah. Well, I think that's, you know, listen. I mean, yeah. I mean, there might. 
I mean, a lot of people might be familiar familiar with some of the the demons or the downfalls of like Tony Bahani. Um, and I'm not looking to to, to right. broadcast them here either. But what we can say, I think what we can say, if you want to leave a positive mark on it, like I think what we can say about Tony is Yeah, that, I think we always should do that too, because yeah. there's, there's plenty to learn. There's so much positivity out there for what people have done good to learn from. Um, and then when people make a mistake, yeah, put it in your register and, and you know, take that to note. But yeah, go ahead. I'm sorry to me to interrupt. No, I think that's perfect because I think the legacy that Tony Bahani leaves behind isn't the mistakes that he made. Um, or, you know, ultimately the, 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 the right. bad stuff, it's, it's the positive, because again, like I said, when people talk about him still, you know, they mention it, it's almost like I said, it's like a whispered reverence, uh, you know, that they, that they kind of mis- whisper his name is, and it's like, the, oh, what, what could have been, what comes and, and the people that were fortunate enough to know him in his prime probably right. took a piece of him like you and like others probably took a piece of that. Oh yeah. A lot of people carry that legacy. A lot of those brands, you know, you know, right behind you, like you, know, uh, Alan Rubin. I remember when he was getting started, and got that. You talk about a big brother to me. I mean, I'm abs- I absolutely love him, and uh, I haven't got to know the. I remember when his sons were younger. Um, haven't had a chance to really talk to them since I've been back in, or uh, really any. But it's uh, it's great to see what they're, they're doing, and uh, Alan did that. Alan Alan was a student of the game. He, he, you know, he knew the history. You know, when you get in, you know, it's like had a lot of friends in the NFL. And there there was one guy, this guy, Michael Roos, who I became friends with down in Nashville. And he's obviously he's really close to John Huber and Mike Connor and those guys and even Shodell. He was a student of the game when he came in as a as a rookie. Like he knew who the old greats were. He could name the old Super Bowl winners. He could name the expansions. And I mm-hmm. think that that's critical is when you come in. And like Alan did, Alan knew who all the players were. He jumped right in and, you know, didn't say what up, what up. He, he did it and look at him today. You know, it's, uh, it's, it's great to see what he's doing. Yeah. I mean, Roos, yeah, I, I remember Michael Roos. He was the, he was the backbone of that line that protected Steve McNair in those early 2000s, you know? Yeah. He, he was uh, left back. Yeah. We, we had a, there's a lot of stories, a lot of stories with me and him. <laughs> He's a, he's a West Coast guy, right? He was like uh, Washington. Washington. Yeah, yeah, he played for Eastern Washington. Um, wanted to play basketball in college. And um, I think it was about like his junior year of high school, and I shouldn't be telling his stories. but And his mom is, um, is a teacher, and they had just emigrated from Estonia. And a uh, football coach in high school said, hey, listen, he's a smart kid. You want to you make sure he gets a full ride to college? He needs to play. He needs to play football, and so he was a tight end his senior year of high school, and I believe his freshman year of college. And they moved him to the line. He was six seven, and uh, you know the rest is history. So, yeah, interesting I mean, guy. It, the field's a... named after him now. So, oh, Eastern that's cool. Washington. Oh yeah. wow. Okay, nice. No, and that field's red before. So you remember? I, I think it was Idaho that has the blue field, and then they went red, and now they made a rule that you can't do that anymore but the their grandfather the existing ones and eastern washington was kicking everybody's ass and so they would call it the blood bowl or the blood bath or whatever because the field was red oh nice i like i like it i think the, the a lot of people thought listen i was in uh i went to tcu and i was in i was in the boise uh conference for a lot of years so i remember the blue field and a lot of people just thought it was obnoxious i was like hey it's you know what it's it's cool man everyone's got you know everyone has a green field they don't you know it's, right the one the one claim to fame so i think i don't know i thought it was great you know so um you know we were talking a little bit about you know obviously the stories and everything and we just and we even talked a little bit about michael Roos there and and i like i knew this i knew that was going to happen i knew i was going to say one thing and we were going to talk about one story and it was going to migrate into another and i'm sorry uh, I no no i i love it i love listen i love stories and and it was really one of the main reasons why i really wanted to get you on my show as soon as possible after i met you at this year's trade show it was such a pleasure and I was like, I, I, I was like, I really have to, I really have to have you on because I, I, I love stories. So this is, uh, this is perfect. Um, you know, but you have your own story and I mean, you have yeah. your storied past and, and uh, I'm going to hop around a little bit in the timeline just on stuff that yeah. I'm kind of interested, but 
before cigars, you, I mean, when you were, I mean, cause you started in cigars very young as well, but there were a lot of other great things you did at a young age. Like you worked on Capitol Hill. Um, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, is it, okay. So was it as an intern, as a page, or is it as an, you know, actual, like an aide? Like what was the actual position? Yes, 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 and yes. So uh, <laughs> all the above, all the above. So basically, uh, I went to Catholic University in Washington D.C. and uh, we, you know, internships back then you didn't have to pay interns, and it was it was important for you to have something on your resume because college, at, you know, I, I was class of ninety one. Um, that, you know, that was the end of the era. He went to college and jobs just, you know, came, came raining down from the skies. You know, that those days were long gone. So you had to build internships and build uh, other stuff for your resume. And, you know, that was it. So I got started. I worked for a senator uh, my junior year as an intern. And then from there, I, you know, I got various jobs. And when you got paid, finally, you would have a job for nine months and you have to look for one for three months. Or if you got a pretty semi-solid job, you're only as long as that elected official was there. And in some of those cases, um, like I worked for Secretary Brown um, in Interior, uh, it was, you're only as good as his appointment, you know, so then you have to go find another job. So that, that was the nature of that beast. And it was, it was great. Listen, uh, I didn't make any money. I had a full head of hair and one chin and it was, uh, it was, it was a lot of fun. So uh, a lot of those things led to the fact of me getting into the cigar industry. I never thought I'd be in the cigar industry um, as, as a main source of, uh, of what I did, you know, so it was, it was pretty interesting. Well, I mean, it was a different, you know, it was a different era back then, you know, like a, yeah. a, smoking was a lot more acceptable, more common practice. You could smoke and, anywhere. You could yeah, smoke yeah. anywhere. Um, you know, and a lot of people think I'm crazy um, or, or think I'm just, I'm just archaic because I'm like, oh, I'm, I would have loved, I would have loved to have, you know, just experienced that, you know, for, for even just a little bit in my life, you know, I mean, for as long as I can remember, there's always been smoking restrictions of some kind and, and uh, everywhere you go almost. And so like when you can smoke indoors, whether it's a smoking lounge or somewhere like Vegas where you can smoke in inside in certain places, right. it's, uh, it's, it's certainly shrunk as the years have gone by. But um, I, I, I don't know. I think it's, I consider it a very a nice privilege and, and, uh, and I really enjoy it. Um, yeah, I will tell you, here's a funny story. So my wife and I will have our 22nd anniversary uh, this coming Saturday, August 7th. Oh, congratulations. California's lockdown on smoking, you know, which kind of set the tone for the rest of the United States and took a long time, obviously, but got there well, a long time because I've been in since 89, you know, working in a retail shop. Um, California was shut down. And when I, when I say they shut down, they shut down overnight. So uh, before, so my wife and I were, we got engaged December 19th, 1997. And then I went out to, uh, I got the job with Davidoff. All right, so before, so like, let's, I, I wanna say those laws went in 96, 97 in California. And I remember she was out at a trade show. She was working for the Ritz Carlton at the time, doing a trade show out in San Francisco. And I went out there and it was just after it was probably less than a year before that. And I don't have the exact date where they really start shutting down smoking. I remember walking into a bar and lighting up a cigar where I didn't think it would be a problem. And the guy put an ashtray in front of me, not mad or anything like, hey, listen, you can't you can't do that. And um, oh, yeah, 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 I forgot. You know, I had a couple of drinks and whatever and I, and I had forgotten. And so that's how long that these laws have, have started and then it matriculated across the rest of the United States. I remember Philly went down, New York went down, Philly went down uh, 10, 12 years ago. But, you know, that was that, that was interesting to, to see that because you had smoking areas of restaurants, you had non-smoking. The bar was always a, okay. And, and there was a couple bars, like a couple restaurants that had a bar and they would be like, 
All right, yeah, but you can't smoke a cigar until like after nine o'clock. Right, right, yeah. So my, we had we had friendly, semi friendly, and then total access. There was a way that we ranked all of them, you know, at, at that point. No, my brother and I experienced that several times in our, you know, in our young adulthood where there were still some restaurants in some towns where you had smoking and non-smoking. And I, I remember a very, a very animated story at an Applebee's, believe it or not, where we went and they were like, oh, you could smoke in the bar when, you know, we asked our waiter, you know, hey, where can we enjoy a cigar? Uh, and they're like, oh yeah, you can go and enjoy it in the bar, no problem. And I was like, oh, this is fantastic. So we we were going to light up there. We, we actually were thinking like somewhere else in town. Right. Um, and uh, they're like, no, you can go into the bar and, and, and smoke. So we're like, oh, great. And so we went in there and, you know, ordered, you know, dessert and, you know, living it up as a couple of 20 year old kids. And, right. and uh, I, I remember, um, I remember it was like it was yesterday we had that presum presumably what would probably be like the shift manager or something coming over and telling us to, to stub out our cigars and we're like what we were told that this week we could smoke here we were told right. that we could do and and he's like we've had some complaints about the cigar smoke and we're like well who complained and this right. late this lady i will never forget it, this lady behind me was like it was me and we turn around and i mean mickey i shit you not she had a mound of cigarette butts in the yeah afternoon. that that always because um yeah because yeah, that that that, all, that always makes fun. Like, what a cigarette person selling a cigar? Because I've casually smoked cigarettes over over my life, and it's just like they're two different things. You don't you don't smoke cigarettes around a cigar. You know what I mean? So it's uh yeah, I find I find that kind of hilarious. But also, you know, when it got people it got moody too. So it's like sometimes they say you could, like you said, you could smoke in the bar. And you go to the smoke in the bar, and then depending on the mood of that manager or, or the, the regulars that were there or whatever. So. Well, and that was like the one, and this is a really cool place. I'm not trying to disparage it at all, but it is really confusing. One of the coolest spots in downtown Fort Worth is this place called the scat lounge. It's a jazz bar. I know. I know. it. Absolutely. Oh yeah. Oh gosh. It's so cool. So cool. Such a cool spot. But now, uh, well, in fact, I don't even think you can smoke in it at all now because I think of the Fort Worth city ordinance. But um, in the last few years where you could, um, they uh, completely eliminated pipe and cigar smoking. You could only smoke cigarettes. In fact, they even had cigarette machines still, if you could believe it. Cigarette vending the, machine. the jazz bars in D.C. wouldn't let you smoke at all, ever. But that was for the singers. That was more for... Sure. Like yeah. the, And I got that. You know, there's a, the, what was it, the Blue Note that was right behind George? A Blues Alley, which was a famous jazz bar, and it's long gone now. But you could never smoke in there. But that was because they had live jazz singers or, or those type of performers with jazz music. And I, and I got that, you know, for the throat. Yeah, no, and I and I get. Yeah, listen, it's your establishment. You can, you know, if it's a private, if it's a private establishment, you can make whatever rules you want. I'm not going to begrudge anyone. It's disappointing, but, um, but yeah, that always confused me. Was like, oh, we can smoke cigarettes. And I remember I I uh, I specifically took uh, some cigarillos in there to kind of blend in hopefully right um uh, and um uh, <laughs> and someone someone rat someone ratted me out same thing someone ratted <laughs> me out and i had a guy come over and said you got to put that out i was like was he smoking this? a jar when he told you to do that no i i no, he was smoking a, a cigarette of some kind and yeah and uh i said i was like tell me how this is different he's like it just is it stinks i was like okay man all right. Well, this is going to be a situation of agree to disagree, but this is your establishment, so that's fine. Um, but it, it'll it'll forever perplex me. I mean, uh, just the 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 cigarette smoker versus cigar smoker thing. I like because I mean I I mean listen I don't know I know I know there are certain lounges out there that are like no cigarette smoking whatsoever. And, and again, they, they, should, they, they should be there. Like I I have friends that will come visit me and support me that casually smoke cigars and they smoke cigarettes and they'll come in. I'm doing an event in a lounge, like here in the Philadelphia area, and I'm like, I can't believe they made me put on a cigarette. I'm like, yeah, it's two different. That sulfur, it doesn't, they don't mix. You know, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. yeah, but I know, like, like if you and I are just hanging out in the backyard, and you, those same friends come over, we're not going to make them put out their cigarette. No, that's a little, that's a little bit more open air, and it's not yeah. really going to affect. I do try to encourage them to use a different ashtray. That's fair. That's fair. Um. So kind of going, go, go back to this, this career in politics here, Mickey. So 
Um, what was like, so uh, I know you, you had several jobs, like you said, what were, uh, what were a couple of the, you said senators, correct? You worked with a couple of. Yeah, I did a couple of things, but can I ask you this? Sure. So sure. we're on that question. We can remember that when we come back. Do you mind if I go take a. Absolutely. So yeah, well, Mickey takes a quick break here. We're, uh, we're kind of going down uh, the, the history of, of Mickey Pegg's uh, journey in the cigar business. And right now we're, we're talking about his foray into politics and uh, I'm eager to kind of get him back to, to talk about uh, a little bit of those, but uh, really appreciate everyone tuning in uh, tonight. I know we got a little bit of a late start um, and that's, that's on, uh, that's on me and the good old fashioned technology. Sometimes, you know, it's the state of Texas. I live in here and, you know, if the weather's poor, sometimes, um, you know, it, you know, it does, the internet connection just doesn't know what to do with things. So we got a little bit of a late start tonight, but, uh, but thanks for tuning in for our 170, uh, 78th take with Mickey Pag of All Saints Cigars, uh, who will be uh, back here in just a moment. And just to do a little bit of a, uh, of announcement here, uh, next week for our 179th take, uh, we'll also be wake, welcoming in. So for the ne- this week, next week, and the following week, uh, we'll be having uh, some guests who will be there, make their first appearances on LLC from our take. So I'm really excited about the next three weeks. You know, we have Mickey tonight, Ram Rodriguez of El Artista Cigars will be uh, next week for take 179. And then take 180 will be Eddie Guerra, um, um, brand senior brand manager over at Davidoff. Uh, he does a lot of work with Camacho and Avo and uh, a new Avo cigars coming out. Uh, so pretty, uh, pretty excited to, uh, to have Eddie on and talk about that. Um, but, uh, so those will be, uh, takes 170, uh, tonight is of course, 178 next week will be take 179. And then the following week will be take 180. Um, so I'm eager to see, uh, in our audience tonight, have, has anyone tried, uh, Mickey cigars? So, uh, the all Saints cigars, uh, it's a newer brand and we're going to be exploring that later on as well. And, uh, but Mickey's no stranger to the cigar industry. So we're, that's what we're uh, doing here tonight. So I'm eager to see if anyone has actually tried any of Mickey's cigars. The All Saints cigars are pretty fantastic. I'm smoking two of them right now uh, at Mickey's Encouragement. Uh, the Dedication, the original, which is a Maduro from uh, wrapped with the San Andreas uh, Maduro wrapper, and then an Ecuadorian Habano as well on the second cigar. So I'm smoking those two simultaneously. So it's quite the experiment. Mickey encouraged me to do this. So that's what I'm doing. Um, Again, while we wait for uh, for Mickey to return here, um, I actually uh, um, am really enjoying this uh, this Habano. This second, this this is, I guess their second line in the uh, the dedication series, dedication series. Um, I'm really enjoying this Habano, and I think it uh, it's actually pretty complimentary to the uh, to the Maduro, which was the original release. But really, really enjoying this Habano. It's fantastic. So I'll be sure to share that with Mickey when he returns. Um, but yeah, I'm eager to see what, uh, if anyone out there has actually, uh, has actually had the opportunity to try All Saints Cigars. Again, it's relatively new. Uh, really great fanfare. There's a lot of supporters out there. You know, Mickey's been in the industry for a long time, which is what we're talking about tonight. But I'm really enjoying these two cigars together. This is a really interesting experiment. And as my audience knows, I'm really, I'm all about experimentation. So um, we got, uh, we got Mickey back and uh, Mickey, I was just telling our audience how I've really enjoyed this experiment of smoking the Habano and the Maduro together. Yeah. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm, I gotta tell you, I'm really, really, I, I, they're both, they're both very good, but I'm really enjoying, I'm really enjoying this Ecuadorian Habano. It's, it's, it's fantastic. Um, yeah. So we just didn't want to take it bland and just slap a wrapper on it. You know, so we did move the percentages a little bit and what it was is it was when we're going through this, I mean, there's a whole flight and you've heard everybody's story about what they go through to get to a blend. Um, it, it was, the percentages were different. A l- 90% of the tobaccos are the same. So I will tell you that, but it was definitely, that was one of the ones that were in there when we were narrowing down when we came, I, I'll actually call it dedication or dedication. That, the reason that's a whole nother story but when we talk i would like to talk about the dedica- dedication online at one point uh that that's that there's a there's five stories in there yeah maybe six um because we named every patrol after somebody in in my life yeah and uh, in frank's life but uh, yeah so we were really excited and it's funny because this the blend originally that i came up with years ago they didn't cut mustard and thank god it didn't because i was able to bring it and it originally had a sumatra wrapper on it i think you and i talked about this at the show yeah the buzz was all the sumatra wrappers 
and I go, there you go. I'm already, be I'm already behind the curve, you know? So it was, uh, but no, it's funny. And we're really proud of it though. So that's great. That's great. So we were, we were talking a little bit about your foray into politics and, you know, yeah. for, you know, I, 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 I've heard you speak about this before that, uh, you know, early career politics is, you know, you're, you're working for nine months and then you're looking for a job for the other three. Um, so it's, it, you know, it's it's not exactly uh um you know job security isn't exactly uh one that would that would describe yeah. a career in politics especially early on um but you know you had the opportunity to also work a bunch of other part-time jobs one being at georgetown tobacco but i'm interested in this how did you get the job at georgetown tobacco so i know the stories about you yeah. being the intern and going down there taking the cab taking the senator's money going down yeah. there, buying some cigars and, and heading back and everything. So did you just, you were just coming and going all the time. And then they finally said, Hey kid, do you want a job here? Or yeah, that, basically, that basically, wow. What a setup. God, man. You, you know, it's funny. You know, I've watched a couple of your shows and now I can see why you and Cooper are on the same team. I mean, it's so thorough. Um, and this, this, the catching up that we were doing over the last week uh, is fun and exciting to see that somebody takes this passionate, you know, I, I know there was some shit out there on the blogs about fake media, new media, what I, you know, all this stuff, but, uh, yeah. So, um, that's basically what happened. And, uh, I, I got a part-time job. It was the most killer part-time job in the world that you could ever ask for. Cause, uh, by the time I got offered, I was out of college and I was working on the Hill and um, I was also bartending and working the door, more of a doorman, you know, six, five, you know, 300 pounds. Uh, I put you at the I door too. <laughs> yeah. So it's, it's funny, you know, once a doorman, always a doorman, you know, you always find yourself up in the door, but um, you know, it was your job literally in order to have a part-time job, there was two, two prerequisites. It was, you have to work at least three, six to nine shifts from 6 p.m. to 9 p.m. And you had to work one weekend shift for eight hours. And you got, you paid wholesale for your cigars. On, you know, you got a lot of free cigars, but you, wholesale. And I'm like, okay, so I get out of, you know, they're traditional nine to five, unless I was doing something or helping with, the, I was working for a lobby firm, a, a trade association, whatever. So six to nine was perfect because my bar, my, my dormant shifts would start until 10 o'clock at night. Oh, perfect. So you, you got your, you were doing your political stuff because I was a, either an intern or a paid assistant or, you know, whatever. Do that and then walk right into the, your, your door job and you could smoke at the door. So I'm <laughs> checking ID, smoking a cigar. It was perfect. And then the weekend, I don't sleep. So I was getting my eight hour shift in before I had to go to work or, or go out partying with my friends. And it was, and it was perfect. And I got to meet a lot of really neat people. So it was, uh, yeah, it was, it was perfect as a part-time sales associate. And I got to learn the industry inside and out and, you know, you sell what you know. And I had an opportunity to meet a lot of people that talked talk to me about their cigars, whether they were the early version of sales reps or brokers at the time. Mm -hmm. um there were very few sales reps at the time there was uh, a bunch of brokers and uh, you know it's the evolution of the business has gone distributors brokers direct reps now back to you were broker heavy again especially with the amount of boutiques that are out there right so watch that evolution has been you know really good so yeah that was um it was it was a perfect i mean i had three jobs when i was out of the college now if you call working the door a job it was, it was fun. I got to talk to people and I uh, got a lot of phone numbers. Sorry, honey. <laughs> you know, it was, uh, and, you know, back then Facebook was a bev now. So whether you're working the door or, or a bartender, that customer was going to leave at a certain point because they want to go to experience the city. Hey, listen, I'll show you map, go up case, go up at K street, over to M street, go over here and go see this guy, see this bartender. And all the bartenders in Dorman would send people around to the different bars. So say a guy paid a door, paid a door charge at our, at our bar uh, to get in. And we'd say, hey, go ask for this person. You'll get him for free. Like if you knew the guy was drinking and spending money, you send him, like you'd write a note. 
free cover F- from one bar to another bar mm-hmm. going in and you go ask for this bartender and they would take care of them that was that's how people got around it. and that's how you made a lot of friends you know it was just uh it was just awesome well networking was so different then that was something that i i, I remember from a, yeah. an interview that you gave was you know you you I said you're you're a big family man and you you talk with such open love and affection for your wife Kim and your and your three daughters and uh, yeah. but I remember when you first I mean okay like you were getting ready to propose to Kim you wanted to you wanted to ask her you wanted to ask her to marry you but you knew you had to have some stability and lo and behold Davidoff comes knocking at your door yeah. and so you get go ahead no go ahead yeah, no, I was sorry. like you get that opportunity and everything um and I remember someone asking you about, oh, well, the travel, you know, you weren't going to spend much time at home, but, uh, but Kim was used to that, right? Because like all these different jobs that you had, you were, you were already traveling quite a bunch, right? Yeah. I, I, I was always traveling quite a bit to begin with and come to understand like her sisters didn't see it so much, but I think my father-in-law, Bill, who's just a, a great example of a uh, now grandfather, uh, father, uh, husband, uh, uncle it's just uh you know it's just down the shore and experiencing bill's breakfast bar you know as we affectionately call it in the mornings but uh he traveled i think when he was building himself and building that business that he that he has done and, and has done a very successful at and being able to provide for his family all the things that in, in the comforts of of his hard work i I, th- I believe he traveled so kimmy was already kind of conditioned to that a little bit so, um, you know, it was a perfect mix. And, you know, even now it's a perfect mix because Kimmy's like, when are you getting on the road again? <laughs> you know, so, and She's even so my daughter sometimes, it. they're so happy to see me come home, I think, or at least they fake it well. Uh, but it's like, hey, when are you getting on the road? You know, because I'm always trying to um, impede my, my, my efficiency models on them. We're like, it doesn't matter. This is efficient for us. You know, leave us alone. Um, so it's pretty funny. Um, but yeah, last so it's been so weird like that. The last year has been so weird. You know, all these people that are so used to traveling and their families are so used to them being out of the house so much. And I mean, yeah, that's, it's, it's, been I think it was great for us as a family, as a family unit, but I really only stuck around for two months. Now, uh, there's been time where I, I've been home for a month or a month for two, but, uh, just as we're building the business, but it was, I finally got on the road after two months, that first two months, I, I mean, I had to go, I mean, we, we put everything into this business. You know, that was a decision. Um, Cause originally I was going to work uh, doing selling mutual funds during the day and then, you know, go visit cigar shops in the evening. And I'm like, if this is going to work and if anybody's going to say yes to this. And that was one of the things when I met with Rocky about us doing, doing stuff, you know, down there in his factories. And if he was going to give me the access that he gave me, he, you know, he wanted to know it was, uh, full and I had already committed to going full at that time so yeah it was um yeah I, and I got on the road and I just got tested a lot uh, you know I, I told the story earlier it was, uh, it's funny when I started doing the COVID testing it was 58 dollars I'm vaccinated now so I don't have to take the <laughs> test as much but um it was 58 dollars the first couple times I did it when I came home it was 175 when I got done doing it oh my god so, yeah so uh, but they, you know, that was the nature of it. So yeah, but I've always, for me, when I had the chance, I mean, Davidoff, so to back up a little bit to that, that question, when Davidoff approached me, I'm like, so you're going to pay me to go visit cigar shops, stuff I did already anyways. And I get an expense account and I get to do this and I get to do that. I'm like, oh, <laughs> hell yeah. I had my golf clubs on the not that I got to use them as much as I, I thought I was going to, you know, I thought it was just going to be this big country club, like go to the resorts and stuff. Uh, it wasn't like that, but still had a great time and just great stories and visiting all these great shops. And I think one of the things that when you're moving around like that, you get to see a lot of things and you get a lot of ideas. Right. And I would take ideas from one part of the country and I would, I would never share somebody's idea too close to them. And you bring it back to them. They're like, "Oh my God, you that's that's genius. You're amazing." I'm like, "Well, now I, I uh, Mika in California kind of is doing that already, or or, or uh, Craig Cass in Charlotte is doing that, and uh, you, you might want to do it up, you know, up here in uh, Pennsylvania. You know, it's um, 
some of those tactical things, you know, like that, whether it's events or, you know, or some kind of special or deal or anything of that sort. So when you, I mean, when you started selling Davidoff, I mean, that was very early on when they had just moved from Cuba to the Dominican production, Dominican Republic and everything. No, it was, it was just after. So they went from Cuba to the Dominican Republic. 89, 90 ish. Right. Yeah. So they had actually, uh, were actually making in Honduras. They had the Zeno brand that George Brightman was working on. So yeah. George Brightman who helped that. And then I obviously was uh, helped uh, uh, Carlito with uh, the Opus. Um, and so I think he gets credited with the, the name a little bit or something George Brightman does. And George Brightman actually started at Georgetown Tobacco, then right. Davidoff, and then Cigar Aficionado. Um, so, and so, so, yeah, so I got in, they had already were well into the production for, with Hanky. And obviously last week, you, you could see some of my, I was wearing my heart on my sleeve a little bit about how much I learned from the industry from his dad uh, last Sunday. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, class on. yeah, so, uh, you know, that was, um, that was amazing. I, I mean, it was one of the greatest experiences of my life, but they had just, matter of fact, Hanky had just stopped making Ashton. Ashton had just went over to uh, Fuente. Because Hanky couldn't handle the capacity. He'd already made a commitment and had a contract with Davidoff at the time. So a lot of people, they don't know, those original Ashtons were actually made by Hanky. And then they went to Fuente. You know, oh, yeah, you're right. A lot of people don't know that. And that's, you know, when I first started, it's interesting, you know, what you learn about after the fact. Because when I first started smoking cigars and then I started subsequently selling them when I started working retail, I would always refer to Ashton as the, 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 the American Davidoff. And it wasn't yes. it wasn't meant as disparaging. It was, it was meant no. to be complimentary. Um, but it's interesting, like, like yeah, the well, the influence of Hanky Kellner was was in there. You know, it wasn't you know that helped Ashton quite a bit because they didn't have the appointed merchant restrictions. Uh, you know, they 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 did you know make sure that you bought into the brand and were able to. They wanted you to be a part of that brand growth, but um, you know, uh, yeah. I'm sorry to interrupt with you. No. I never said it that way because I saw both of them equally because both of their reps were so awesome and teaching me about their brands. But I never I never said that. I never that's 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 a great correlation. I love it. Yeah, I mean it was just like I said, it was an early observation that I had that, you know, and, I, and when I learned about the history of the two brands and, and then how Hanky actually played a, a part, obviously a, a, a prominent, a much more prominent role in in Davidoff. And you know, Fuente has certainly made that a staple of Ashton now. You know, with the last twenty plus years, so it's 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 interesting to just to kind of go back and see how close. Like we always talk and comment about how small this industry really is, but when you actually go back to some of the roots and stuff, like it's it, it's it's even closer than than most people imagine, which is yeah. Impressive. Um, but uh, you know, again, to to come to bring it back to you and everything, when you uh, you, so <laughs> I know this sounds silly, but. I, I'm, I'm, I'm just, I'm just fascinated by the fact that, you know, like you've been around for, for so long and before the days of Facebook, you know, and, you know, when you started, I mean, there, it wasn't like, we're not talking about like, I remember interviewing Cynthia Fuente and she was telling me how you, she used to call orders in from a payphone. I know that wasn't. Mm -hmm. yeah. I did the same thing. Oh, you did the same. Okay. I was like, I know you had a cell phone, right? And like when you were doing that. We had a cell used... phone, but it, the cell phone wasn't as, matter of fact, Al Remp was my national sales manager at Davidoff. Don't you use it. it. Don't do it. It's so expensive. Don't use uh, it. No, no. We didn't get our balls busted that much. We did for a little bit, but we were exploding so much that they didn't care at a certain point. But uh, so Al Ramp gets in my car. And I used to joke because uh, he would, he got rid of his laptop. He made one of his reps run over his laptop and uh, he had a legal pad and we, and he would write in every, he was so cheap. He would write in every corner, you know, it was the company's time, but he respected the company's time. He would write in every little corner, always had these notes, and he had his own section in the way he'd write his notes. And we always called it, we'd hold up a legal pad. We're like, this is the Al Ramp laptop. He gets to my car, and he goes, where's your quarters? And I go, I don't need quarters. Like, you know, they gave me, because you had calling cards, too. You right. had these that you could charge back, or you, you, we had a number you called and took you directly in, a private number. And it would be charged back to Davidoff when I was around. And that would break down sometimes. He goes, where's your quarters? And I go, 
quarters. What do I need quarters for? He goes, because you have to call it an order. And I go, um, I don't have any quarters. We immediately had to go to the bank and I had to get like $50 in quarters. They show me how to write that on my expense report, which was write quarters off on your expense report. But it was for communication. So you had a line item for that. And uh, so we come out of account and I want to say we were, we were in South Carolina. Yes, we were in South Carolina. And he goes, when are you going to call that order? We just, no, we had like three sales calls and then we had like two hour drive, two and a half hour drive before or next sales call. He goes, what are you going to call those orders in? You don't call them in time. They can't ship them out. And then blah, blah, blah. And I go, uh, well, it's raining and blah. And he goes, no. Pull into that pull into that rest area. Pull into that rest area. He goes, there's phones right over there. Back then, there's lines of phones, pay phones right. and rest areas with really long cords. And he thought, like, put the, put the quarters in, da, 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 take the cord, roll up the window, and we're like that. And I called it in the orders. And I'll never remember the first time. Um, and what I would do at night, we would uh, we'd go to bed. And I didn't know that area with maps. I would literally go drive our, my route the next night for the next day and make sure I could do it and act like I, I know this. I don't have to have my map out. And that's one of the things that I was like, yeah, this kid's solid. And that's oh, nice. what I would do. I would go drive my freaking route. The night before, after he thought we were in bed, sometimes at one o'clock in the morning, go back to bed and get up. Like, do you know where you're going? Did you look at the map? And I'm like, yeah, yeah, I got it. I, I know the area. Like, never been there before in my life. And that's what I would do. Well, I'm a big fan of uh, the uh, the old show from the uh, it was only on for two seasons. It was written by written and produced by Aaron Sorkin, called Sports Night. And uh, I don't know if you ever saw it, but. Uh, yeah. Uh, Robert Gillum is a character and his name's Isaac Jaffe. He's talking about, he's talking about his son-in-law and he, he's about to be a grandma grandfather for the first time. And he's talking shit about his son-in-law saying, Hey, you didn't rehearse the route. You didn't, he didn't rehearse the ha- route to get to the hospital. And he's like, I'm, you know, he's, you know, your son-in-law, I my daughters. <laughs> he's like, your, your son-in-law is a, you know, is a, is a radar officer in the United States Navy. I think he can find his way to, you know, <laughs> to, a, to right. a hospital, but, uh, um, but it's 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 funny that you say that because that kind of reminds me of that reminds me of of when I started learning to drive and my my father would take me like if I was going to go someplace right. you know, two weeks before he would make me re- he would take me to rehearse the route really and so absolutely my like, my dad that's where I learned it from yeah that's so uh, that's it's really interesting but um you know I, I it's it, it, you know it, it's still kind of, it's still kind of, you know, we're only talking about, I mean, yeah, you've been in the industry for a long time, but it, you know, in the grand scheme of things, that was, you know, 20 years ago. And that's, yeah. that's how, that's how far it's come. And, um, you know, I, I, I would just love for you to be in a room with other reps that are just coming up now and then hearing them complain about some certain things and like, man, guys, you don't know how lucky you have it. <laughs> kind of. Yeah. Cause I used to print out those freaking map quest things and I would have, like this and then if you had to change your route that'd fuck everything up because like oh well you have to get over here like yeah you know because somebody would say hey listen mickey uh such and such company is bailing on me at the last minute for this event do you, can you do it i'm like can you give me 30 minutes they're like why do you need 30 minutes because i want to make sure that i can reroute and and schedule these people and, and tell them and i would be honest like Mr. Retailer or Mrs. Retailer, uh, I have an opportunity to do this event. Uh, can I come see you for a regular sales call the day after or something else? And they're like, oh, absolutely. You're doing that. You're doing that. Like, you do that. And I call them back. I'm like, yes, I'm good to go. You know, I would. And then I'm like, oh, I don't have my map quest. I can't print it out. Then you had to go back to the maps and stuff like that. So it was pretty interesting. D- different um, day and age. Sometimes I would, yeah, one time, Craig Cass, I mean, I drove through the night, didn't go to sleep to get one event and then did another event to drive through the night because it was a point of merchant event that we had to get done. And um, I think those are the things that kind of put me in the spotlight a little bit, though, too. So, I mean, you know, even though Davidoff at the time wasn't that, I mean, it wasn't 
I mean, it was certainly, I mean, it was up there uh, in terms of notoriety and everything at the time, even because it came onto the American market with, with such a, with such a splash. So you already kind of had that notoriety and everything, but it, it, that being said, it still wasn't necessarily what the power brand that it is today necessarily, but it was up there. I mean, to go from a kid working part-time in politics to part-time at Georgetown Tobacco, then full-time, but then Davidoff offers you this job to go work. I mean, straight, I mean, you went straight to the top when it comes to being, when you talk about rep jobs, I mean. Yeah, I was very fortunate. Was it, was, were you intimidated at all? I mean, you talk about the fun times. Were, was it intimidating? Was it, did, you, did you feel the weight of that responsibility or was were you just so ingrained in it already in the moment that you were just, you were ready to go? Oh, uh, when I was the CAO, I, uh, I, when, I, when I took over that sales operation, I was for about a day. And then I had guys like John Heber, Mike Condor, John o and Tim, like, just just do this just freaking do it and um i had a lot of people putting their uh, arms around my shoulder and i was very fortunate you know when you say when everybody has mentors I'm like i fuck man i go i, I don't think i think enough, enough of these people in my life you know it, it, it's unbelievable like manny ferraro from ashton um uh, uh chip you know who's not I, I guess he's not with ashton anymore um uh uh uh, Jorge Padron, George Padron. Um, I, I could call, like these people I could call, Dave Bullock. Dave Bullock is probably one of the biggest inspiration. I learned more from Dave Bullock than I did at grad school at the University of Pennsylvania, preparing for like business and, you know, the acumen of looking at numbers and looking at, at sales strategy. Because these guys, you know, these guys, he was a general at the time and then he went to Rocky. Um, Al Ramp, who, uh, uh, God, we would battle like father and son, but at the end of the day, you know, he was just one of the most beautiful guys in my life. Uh, Dave, Dave Berkebile from Georgetown Tobacco, uh, these people, like, for some reason, I was, I've never been afraid to ask for help or ask for something that I don't know. And sometimes that drives my wife crazy, you know, like, you know, if you don't ask, the answer, you know, you have a hundred percent chance of getting a no if you don't ask. You know, and it's like I've been very fortunate, and uh, the, the, a lot of people when I was going up quickly to the ranks at that time, you know, it's funny. I was like the young, I was the youngest guy, I was the tallest guy, and I was the only guy wearing a bow tie. Now, Glenn Loops wearing a bow tie, Omar <laughs> makes he look like a midget. Um, I'm sorry, like a small person. Uh, <laughs> and then all these young studs that are out there now that are doing awesome and have such passion for the industry. So, but uh, now I'm just like the old guy, like, you know, finally launching a brand. But uh, yeah, so, I don't know, does that answer the question? Did I go off on oh. a tangent again? Oh, no, no, it does. It does. It, it, you know, it, you like you Thank said- Thank God this whole industry is ADHD like me. <laughs> well, I mean, like, like you said there, I mean- you know, you didn't necessarily think of it. like, you know, the rest of us as outsiders, you know, even myself, if, you know, if, if Davidoff walked into my door tomorrow and said, Hey, we want to offer you this, this, a similar job, you know, you know, I don't, you know, I don't know what would happen after that, but I, I know that if I ended up taking it, the, the, the weight, the responsibility would weigh pretty heavily on me. I know that I would probably be successful at it. And I'm not, and I'm not, I know I'm having Eddie on the no, Eddie on the show here in a couple of weeks. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not fishing for a job necessarily. Oh, there's but, some great stories right there. What a fantastic what he's done. Oh my gosh, incredible. Um, but it's and I'm still a geek fan of everybody that's in the industry. You know, it's well, funny. It, like Pete Johnson and I are boys. But I still kind of geek out when I'm around them. You know, um, Padron. I still geek out when I'm around them. Rocky, who I have come him Nimish and Nish. Dave, I have conversations with on a weekly basis. I still get, you know, geeked out. Um, well, and they have, and they have know. that same reverence for you. Like I've heard people talk about, t- talk about you with that same kind of, that same kind of like reference as well. So yeah, it's, I don't it's, understand it, but yeah, it, it's nice and it's sweet that that's said, but yeah, just, uh, man, I just love being a student of this game. It's, it's freaking awesome. And I'm learning more from you guys that I've ever learned, you know, on a quick basis, because you guys are really doing busting your balls, you know, getting hold of information and taking stuff to market. It, it's uh, that's why I couldn't wait to hug you when I saw you, a little bear hug. 
it, it, it was it was about close to a definition of a bear hug that I've ever had, except for, like you said, Omar DeFrias probably falls in that category as well, um, where it was actually about as literal of a bear hug as you could imagine. But uh, um, and I, I enjoyed it. I look forward to many more, many more, many more bear hugs with uh, with Mickey Pag. Um, <laughs> but we're going to we're going to we're going to jump into some more uh, of your stories here in a bit. But I want to take a quick break to talk. Uh, we're going to do a couple of our fun segments. Yep. Uh, here and uh, the first segment here is our our popular one must go, which is always uh, brought to you by United Cigars, featuring La Giana Havana and distributors of Jose, Jose Dominguez, Garofalo, uh, Bandolero, and the Jose highly acclaimed Dominguez. I love those guys. Dave Garofalo. Matter of fact, I'm finishing up my recipe for his book right now. So oh, uh, which is funny. But not I not your not your wife's recipe. gravy recipe. Apparently, that's that's like Fort Knox level security that she has a handcuffed right on that. Yes, yeah. So actually, Kimmy's helping me with it. So a little inside this, you're hearing it first. Oh, exclusive, love it. Yes, and I'll and um, I'll tell you this. It's called Saintly Caesar. Ooh, there's your inside scoop. I love the alliterative. ahead of the coop. Your inside scoop ahead of the coop. <laughs> it's always a great privilege of mine whenever I know something before Coop. It's only happened like three times. Um, On the hat trick? Literally was, uh, literally was once uh, this past trade show where someone shared something with me. Coop walks in the rocks into the room and I was like, hey, blah, 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 blah. This happened. I was like, did you know about this? And he's like, no. I was like, I knew something before you. It was only five seconds. It didn't matter. It was, uh, right. I, 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 I scooped the Coop. It was fantastic. Uh, so, but, to one must go uh, start one today um and start living smoke one today and start living united um so mickey this segment i'm not sure if you're familiar with it but this has become a really popular no, show I'm scared. it's not it's this one's fun so um so we've got i, I give you three things and you just got to kick one to the curb that's it so that's that's really it's really all it is uh, and it's just for fun obviously this isn't like permanent or anything like that and well, this this question does almost straddle the lines of blasphemy so i i, I think yeah, no one's going to get in trouble except for me for asking it so um so here here's the question for you and i because i know these three figures play a very prominent role in your life and the life of all saints cigars so Holy shit. so here we go so here are your three choices one's got to go so the first one is saint michael okay your mickey peg saint that's saint michael michael is the uh the Yep. Um, the right hand it, of God, the archangel himself, and uh, very powerful. Same as special forces and the police and first responders. Yep. And uh, when, uh, certainly a saint you do not want to cross. Um, the second yeah. one is St. Patrick, um, who, I mean, mu you know, the, as every school child knows, mustered all the snakes out of, uh, out of Ireland. The thing I love about St. Patrick is that he, he was enslaved in time in his time of Ireland, yes. he escaped and then he went back back then he went back yeah that's the like what do you hear what do you hear the short story that you, you tell the kids and there's actually a prayer behind it yeah they talk about that yeah it was actually a book uh we have a short kids book that i used to read my daughters and they talked about that and i'd always do it in an irish accent and uh they said you don't have an irish accent it sounds more welsh <laughs> So I know St. Patrick plays a prominent role in All Saints because that was the day that you were actually going to launch. Yeah, um, well, not launch, but uh, take our press release out. Yeah, right. And uh, you know, a thing, a little tiny thing called COVID nineteen happened. Um, so, but it's still a prominent, it's, not, it's still a prominent role in the uh, the, the yeah. story of All Saints. And then, lastly, uh, the latest, the latest addition um, to the All Saints family, the Saint Francis. So Saint Francis. Uh, one of my favorite saints, St. Francis of Assisi, one of my favorite quotes, you know, if uh, if you ever have a question about a man's character, uh, simply look at his friends. His friends, yeah, absolutely. Um, you said that before the St. Francis. I've, I've, I've seen some of your stuff. Yeah. Yes, yeah, well, and, and I, I mentioned it, I mentioned it, uh, I mentioned it in our interview uh, at the trade show, which yeah. uh, you'll be able to see on our Cigar Coop coverage here shortly in the next few days. But, uh, um, so those are your choices, Mickey. St. Francis, St. Patrick, St. Michael. Which one gets the, which one do you boot out of that group? Which one's the least fair? However you want to interpret it. But which I got to tell you, um, you had me really scared. And then when you start going on the Saints uh, thing, you, you, uh, you really had me scared. I will tell you, I'm going to, I promise you, I'm going to tell you what I'm going to say. Okay. All right. I promise you, tell me what do you think I was going to say? 
because I know what I think you're going to say. Okay. What so, do you, what do you think I was going to? What do you think my answer is going to be? Okay, I think your answer is going to be Saint Michael, and I tell you why. Ah, yeah, no, I thought you were going to say Saint Patrick because no. of the press release. No, not St. Patrick. I know why, because the the motto is right behind you in Latin, and I'm not going to attempt to speak it in Latin, but I know what it means. It means God hates a coward, and I know you don't shrink from a challenge. So just because it didn't work out the way you wanted to, that's that's even more motivation for you to pick it. So I knew you were not going to kick St. Patrick to the curb. Okay, so I will tell you, you 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 got it. It was St. Michael, and I'll tell you why. Uh, Listen, that was one of the first ones I was on the list uh, from the very beginning. uh, and so was St. Christopher. Yeah, patron saint uh, of travel. I mean, um, so I will, yeah, uh, St. Christopher was actually, uh, in my mind, uh, in Frank's mind, my partner, Frank Leo, uh, uh, head of St. Michael and St. Francis because of the travel that, that, that has to happen. San Cristobal is gone. Astro knows right. it. Right. San Miguel is gone. Yeah. Gurkha. Uh, Gurkha owns it. That, and that, that's why I would say I would say of those three is St. Michael. So, um, yeah, only because merely of that fact. And, you know, and, you know, in, in, in all fairness, too, I think that if anybody was able to use the St. Michael name outside, if, 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 if Gurkha ever said, and Juan e. Lopez and I are very dear friends. Um, if anybody else that should have the ability to use that name, and I'll be dead honest with you, is I think protocol. Yeah, that makes total sense. Or so, so. maybe Southern Draw, maybe. Um, I, um, you know, his special forces background because yeah. he's picked such, and then obviously, you know, Wani with, um, you know, with uh, police. So, um, I hope that doesn't create some kind of political hotbed, but it's over. It's not going to happen. Nobody else is going to be able to use it. And that's fine. So, but yeah. So, and obviously my favorite of the three would be um, St. Francis, obviously a, because Frank's my partner, uh, which uh, honestly uh, that blend and the name didn't, there wasn't the name and then the blend, there was the blend and then the name to be honest with you, because we were still waiting to hear back from the trademark. Uh, We had other names that we were to use. And I uh, think Patrick, I think we've researched. And what happens is when you go to our trademark um, attorney, which a lot of people do use in the industry, uh, they give you a green, yellow, or red. And I think we had borderline red, you know, on that. that, that, that they try to make it as easy for you to understand, like yeah. what to pursue, what not to pursue. So um, two plus two is four. Make it simple. Yeah. Right, right. So gotcha. Damn it! I thought you were going to say. I thought I was. I, I thought I was doing like the reverse whammy question on you. And, and uh, no, no, because I thought just from the media standpoint, I thought you would say, "Oh, probably St. Patrick." But no, yeah. And then your defense of that answer, I thought was pretty cool too. Yeah, the Lord hates a coward. It's actually the Lord hates a coward. The Lord hates. If a coward. it was the Lord, there would be more words up there. So. Like I said, my my Latin is very uh, weak, and by being very weak, I mean. Oh, mine's really so. weak too. Uh, we have a buddy. Uh, guy joshua leblanc out of louisiana who's an uh, ordained deacon uh is now helping us with our latin to make sure that we uh don't get ourselves in trouble with our latin nice i mean i know that i know i know certain things and i know i know vidi vidi vici you know i came i saw a conquer yeah. you know everyone you know yeah. who's uh you know who's read about julius caesar knows that one but uh um and et tu brute easy one um not too not too difficult there but uh um I always thought he was talking about champagne forever there. Right. Et tu brute. <laughs> and I'll have some of that champagne. <laughs> yeah, I'll have some of that. Sounds good. Pour one while you're stabbing me in the back, Brutus. Appreciate it. Right. Uh, but uh, no, no, that was, uh, yeah, I was just thought it was a fun exercise considering the, the names of your cigars and maybe your company and everything. And, and then obviously your, you know, your religious background too. I, the whole, you know, um, I'm, I'm actually not a practicing Catholic. I, 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 my, my grandmother was, but I, I grew up Protestant. This got a lot more Catholic than we wanted it to be, by the way. So there's, there, there's more story. As a matter of fact, Alan Rubin, one of my dear friends, Sammy Phillips, uh, like I have a tremendous amount of Jewish friends and, uh, you know, they said all saints are like, ah, not a problem. Like, you know, we, Hey, listen, 
we call people saints too. Like that's a saint. That's a saint is, yeah. saint is bigger than the word saint. I think is bigger than the Catholic interpretation. There's a lot of people don't like what a saint means, you know, from a from a Catholic or that point of view. And I get it, but they like what it what it implies that a person is. That person is a saint. And that's one of the ways we came to all saints. I was talking about the people in my lives. And I kept saying that person's the saint, this person's the saint. And that's kind of been another uh, partner of ours, of ours kind of brought that together. So, yeah, I mean, it was, you know, it was really uh, kind of kismet too, you know, with you being named Michael, you know, Frank, you know, yeah. Francis, and then, you know, your other, your other partner, I believe his name is Martin. Is that correct? Mark. Yeah. Yeah. So I, big, big saint. <laughs> Hashtag big saint. <laughs> no, we can't. Turn inside to us. Uh, but uh, no, I, 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 I've, I mean, it was one of the things that I was really excited about. I was like, yeah, I don't know how far you guys are planning on taking it, but I'm, I'm fascinated because I'm fascinated by the whole, the whole history of, of patron saints and stuff. And it's something for, yeah. you know, for uh, Miguel and I share this weird, Miguel Shadell and I share this weird uh, affinity for presidential history, but I also have this weird affinity for, for, for sainthood history. And I've, I've, I've studied it. So does Shoddy though. So Shoddy, Shoddy knows his saints very well. And he oh. knows the deeper and the, uh, the cosmic correlations too we've had conversations oh, with oh wow i'm gonna have and to baseball I'm gonna... i mean there's nothing he's like a freaking encyclopedia of everything he really is well, and, I... he, he, and he doesn't forget anything he can recite it he just that guy i've never seen him refer to notes in my entire life i gotta tell you the story about when i hired him you're gonna love it can oh, i take I... a break yeah go we'll take a break and then come back and let's have i it told you i warned you i'm sorry no it's like, all good it's all good. All right. So, right um, so that was our one must go segment. And as always, um, we uh, we'd love to thank our sponsor, United Cigars. It's always brought to you. Our one must go is always brought to you by United Cigars, featuring La Gian Havana, distributors Jose Dominguez, Bandolero, Garofalo, and the highly acclaimed Atabay and Byron lines. Buy United, smoke United, live United. So smoke one today and start living United. Um, so. Mickey uh, chose uh, Mickey chose Saint Michael, but um, I, I, I found I found this question interesting because I thought it would be just wanting to you know see take it allow him to take it to his own interpretation, and he took it a direction that I wasn't even necessarily implying, uh, which was he used used in reference to to the company and how they would be using potentially or could potentially use some of these names. And so, as he mentioned, you know, obviously uh, St. Michael or San Miguel is owned, uh, the trademark is owned and, um, and uh, as are some, as are some other, you know, St. Christopher, St. Cristobal and some other, uh, other saints have already kind of been, kind of been uh, taken by, uh, by a trademark. So this interesting interpretation of the question, I was really excited to, to get his take on it. And uh, he did not disappoint. Um, so the, you know, as we wait for Mickey to come back here in a moment, uh, do want to, uh, we're going to introduce our, our next segment, which is, of course, my favorite, uh, has become my favorite segment of this show, which is uh, our charity segment, which we, every week since uh, late last year, um, I have brought on guests and we have um, asked each guest to spotlight or highlight or feature a nonprofit or charity of their choosing. And it's, uh, it's become one of my favorite pastimes in the show because it, it is, it really spotlights the the giving nature of the men and women of this industry, and uh, I've really really enjoyed really enjoyed this uh, this exercise, and we've raised some uh, some great funds, some good money, um, and we've spotlighted an incredible diverse group of of charities and nonprofits. We've had a couple of repeats, which not a bad thing at all, and. Uh, um, so it, it, it shows to, it, if anything, the repeat ones show to me the power that those, uh, that those organizations have for individuals in this industry, yes, but even outside of it and, and uh, the great work that they're doing. So Mickey will be coming back here in a second and I'll introduce his charity. But in the meantime, uh, Mickey asked us to not only spotlight his charity, which uh, as he's getting to sit down, we'll talk about his charity of choice in just a second, but he asked to spotlight also his partner's uh, charity of choice. So Frank Leo, who who, uh, who isn't with us tonight, uh, other than in spirit, uh, because uh, he's such a 
uh, a powerful force behind the All Saints brand, but he has to spotlight uh, one of my favorite charities um, and nonprofits, which is St. Jude's Children's Hospital, which is an amazing organization founded by Danny Thomas and um, just an incredible organization for what they do for children. I participate in at least one or two St. Jude, uh, St. Jude's uh, fundraisers uh, each year. Uh, so the Frank, the Frank wanted to spotlight them. I'm really excited about. So in the show notes, you'll find a link to St. Jude's Children's Hospital, but you'll also find a link to Mickey's Charity of Choice, um, which I was really excited because I, I actually know a little bit about this organization, but I'll, I'll let Mickey uh, do the honors here in a second. But his choice uh, was Family Support Line, um, which you can check them out at familysupportline.org. And uh, their, I mean, their, their slogan, their mission is we prevent the harm and we heal the hurt. Um, very, very wonderful organization that's core mission is to advance the prevention and treatment of child sexual abuse. So um, Mickey, um, as, as you've uh, been able to come back and uh, join us, uh, we're going to go ahead and spotlight your charity of choice now, um, which of course is Family Support Line. So as I gave that brief introduction about it, what an amazing organization. I'm so glad that you chose it. But uh, what, uh, why, why did this charity speak to you specifically? It wasn't the charity that first spoke to me. It was um, um, dear friends of uh, Kimmy and I's, uh, Kevin and Jenny Smith. Uh, started, uh, and, you know, you've heard bids for kids and the, their auction, and it's a fundraiser that happens at our country club, and that's where he does it. And he's in charge of the local chapter. I, I, I don't know if it's Philly or, or Delaware County or whatever, but that was one that was uh, very special. And, um, you know, it's funny when they ask us to go to the charity, of course, we were always going to support your friends, right? I go and we do this and um, then I learned what I was, was about and there's some personal reasons why it, it means so much to me and um, it was just something that we really liked and um, to say that Kimmy and I do a lot for it uh, is, is not true it's it's done through Kevin and uh, Jenny Smith and, um, and and Kevin's a very uh, guy that I get to play golf with when I when I get a chance to play golf and the guy that I, get, I love smoking a cigar with and he loves my cigars and that's all he usually has uh when he's not smoking my cigars though I will tell you he's smoking <laughs> he's smoking uh, like Bradley but um it it's um uh yeah it, it, it's something that it's just dear to our heart and and I remember sitting there we're at the auction and we're, we're, we're bidding on trips and all this other stuff. And, and somebody had already explained in the, in the course of, you know, you golf and then you go to this charity and then a lot of guys go off to another charity golf outing that's uh, in Jersey. So it's like almost a whole weekend of, and there's a mixture of charities that are involved. There's a thing called EVAD and that's a, now I'm just complicating the story a little bit, but I, I said, Kev, what is this all about? And he was, and he goes, well, when are you listening before? And I'm like, no, I was at the bar getting a drink and trying to figure out when I'm going to smoke a cigar. And he kind of whispered in my ear everything was about. And it really, uh, really hit close to me. And um, for a multitude of reasons. And uh, so I just kind of fell in love with it from there. And uh, something that's, that's probably, you know, there, there's, there's other charities that we're involved with. You know, but it's something that, um, that we're probably the most active in. So, and that's really great. I don't think we're active enough. And uh, so thank you for giving us the opportunity to spotlight that and um, spotlight our, our dear friends, uh, Kevin and uh, Jenny Smith. So it's very sweet. Thank you. And I saw the buttons you put out there and all the other things for, for that. And uh, that, that was very sweet. Thank you. Oh, you're, you're very, very welcome, Mickey. This is, again, this is probably has become my favorite segment on this show because it, it like I said, it, it it's, it, it gives uh, it gives my guests the opportunity to spotlight something that they're very passionate about outside of outside of cigar. Well, not necessarily outside of cigars, but sometimes you know, for the most part, outside of cigars. And and uh, you know, I I've really I've really chosen to make my show, yeah, about cigars, but more importantly about the people that I'm talking to. And and right. when you um, you know, I have there there are several things that I'm very passionate about in life. Um, you know, outside of my family, um. But uh, in 
and like I always tell people, if you want to, if you want to, if you want to get me riled up, like you see, like people see me riled up about cigar rights, you know, just mention, you know, there's a couple of things you can mention. One of them is um, the, uh, the status of, of, of healthcare and support systems for our nation's veterans. Uh, my father was, yeah. my, my father's a veteran. And if you want to get me riled up, just mention about the inadequacy of, of that uh, in this country. And or I'll, ask, I'll, ask my partner about it. Who went to the Air Force Academy? Yeah. <laughs> I, I, well, there's many more that we were involved. This is something that we've been a part of. All right. Because I would have loved to have put it in there, CRA. And I'm mm -hmm. not taking away from CRA. I'm not taking away from no. PCA. I'm not taking away from Cigars for Warriors. We're actually working on a project that we're trying to get done. But, you know, it's not as easy to get these cigars there. Those guys bust their ass to get those cigars there. It's just like, you, just getting the, getting the cigars to those guys is the easy part for them and what they go through. And I've heard him talk to Frank, who uh, has a lot of connections as well, you know, at least on the Air Force side. Um, it, it's not easy to get these to these these, these deployed troops because that's part of the thing. It has to go to deployed troops, which I think is fantastic. So. Yeah, no, but, Storm does an incredible job with Cigars for Warriors, but no, I, I'm with with Family Support Line. This is a this is actually an organization, like I said, I've been aware of for quite some time, and um, it's a again, it's another passionate area for me. Um, you know, I think that you know, you know, children, unfortunately, um, you know, children, unfortunately, are, are voiceless in a lot of cases, and especially in in when they're in but difficult they're positions like this. You know this this type of organization and the work that they do and the work that that you and your friends Kevin and and uh, I apologize I, did, I forgot her name Jenny 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 yeah. and Kevin do are are giving a voice to those children and it's 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 beautiful it really is it's beautiful to a in yeah. to a horrific uh, horrific circumstance and uh, the help and the aid and the work that organizations like uh, Family Support Line do. Um, they're a hotline, which is amazing for people mm -hmm. that they can call, like uh, people, uh, people that might think that somebody uh, is in need, or uh, or a kid, uh, uh, or a child, you know, if, uh, or somebody that's been on the bad side of what we're talking about, can have the ability to call that number. They don't know that number exists, but you know, one of the things that is so helpful about this organization is getting that known, so they know that they have a resource to call. It, you know, they take the appropriate measures to help that as well. So, I think is is awesome. Yeah, it it really is. And so, thank you, thank you for bringing it to our attention, Mickey. I really appreciate it. Really appreciate this opportunity to spotlight such a great well, organization. I, I, my, well, Kimmy and I um, thank uh, obviously Kevin, you know, Kevin and Jenny Smith more than anybody on that for bringing it to our attention. So. So with, with every week, I always tell my guests this, Mickey. Uh, so um, my, my wife can and I, I – can, can I just say one more thing, too? Please, absolutely. Um, and I would love to talk about St. Jude because Frank, unfortunately, can't be here to talk about it. And we got to get Frank on the show, too, and talk about uh, what he's bringing to the table. Can I ask a favor of you? Could Please. you light up the St. Francis and the other St. Francis and do and do a rail smoke? And I, I, I know you're busy. You can still um, – and rail smoke those two next to each other we could talk sure. about it when we get back to cigars but get into and then um I, you know the the saint jude thing and i what i want to talk about with that and uh, and i can't talk about too much because i don't know as much as uh frank ever since the day i met frank for, for many years he's always wears that lapel if you ever see him and he's wearing a sport coat you will always see that lapel pin on his lapel. The St. Jude's lapel? Yeah, yeah, he always has that. It, it, he is so passionate about that for so many reasons. It's 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 phenomenal. And um, that that's, um, you know, it, 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 it's dear to my heart because it's so dear to his heart. Uh, not because just of that, obviously, but it's, he brought so much attention to me and, and uh, to us and our company. And that's why it, it's prominent in our company as well. So that's wonderful. And so later tonight, uh, Mickey, I'll be, uh, my wife and I will be making small donations to both organizations, family support line and St. Jude in, uh, and I'll, I'll, I'll amend it uh, in honor of you, uh, your wife, Kim, 
Frank, Kevin, and Jenny, um, who were able to bring these uh, these charities to uh, to light tonight. So thank you so much, and it, it, I look forward. It, to it. it would be short not to mention AJ, uh, Frank's wife. Okay, is very a strong supporter. So would, if if Frank is not doing something or having a communication with St. Jude, uh, she is. And she, uh, oh, she's a, a very talented uh, person as well. She is an avid reader, and you know, and you talk about the love of kids, of, of children. They're you know, um, they're they're a great family, and he puts his family first and foremost. Um, family, charity, and life. You know, that's his kind of kind of his motto a little bit. So, and AJ's uh, uh, a phenomenal person as well. Wonderful. Well, thank you, Mickey. I really appreciate that. And uh, again, I can't thank you enough for bringing these two charities to uh, to tonight's take. And I'm 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 cutting and, and toasting the foots of the two Saint Francis that I have uh, in preparation for our our final uh, final journey down your journey. Uh, so let's start let's start with uh, when you left to when you left uh, Davidoff to become the uh, the national sales. Uh, manager uh director um for cao so yeah. yano and uh his son tim bring you in uh and that's where you know and eileen so it was jano it's actually pronounced uh jano jano um even though it's kano as a lot yeah. of people call it I was, cao is, i always uh, said kano until i was corrected years later but yeah yeah no, they never took offense to that so yeah, what i mean what a life right there uh of his, uh, you know, and, uh, you know, that, that unfortunately I, I never, I never had the opportunity or the, uh, or the honor of meeting him, but what a life he led, um, just, uh, just a, a journeyman of so much and, and giving too. you know, I mean, his legacy was philanthropy as well. So, I mean, that's oh, big time. Amazingly. Um, yeah, you know, he, he came over from Turkey, uh, went to Columbia, and that's where he met his wife, uh, Essen, and uh, she was on a teaching fellowship, and he was on for engineering. Uh, they fell in love, and yeah, yada yada yada, and you know, um, the rest is history. Yeah, the rest is history. So had two beautiful kids, uh, Tim and Eileen, and Eileen was a big part of the growth of that company as well. So. And I'd love, I'd love to explore your time at CAO a little bit more in detail at some other time. But there, 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 one, there is one thing I do want to bring up because it was a very powerful moment that I learned about with you. So everyone knows the story. Um, the Ossian family sells to, uh, sells to General. And, of course, you, you leave. Uh, Mickey, you still with me? Mickey? Yeah. Okay, sorry. We're back. We're back. Yeah. No problem. So you you of course leave, and and if if memory serves correctly, you were one of the you were one of the first in the company to actually leave. Is that correct? Uh, yeah, no, I was the first. The first. Okay. <laughs> and um, a very you know a very challenging a very challenging time. In fact, uh, as you've lamented in several interviews, you didn't smoke a cigar for a year. Yeah, about a year. What, I mean, during that time, I mean, what was, was, did uh, cigars were kind of out of your system, so to speak? I mean, and you were, you know, you had, you'd found a new, I guess, course in life with, uh, with Lincoln Financial and everything was, I mean, was the last thing you wanted to do was light up another cigar? Was it that far out of your mind or you just, you, you just wanted to get away from it because. Uh, no, you know, it's funny because I've said it uh, for so many years is that uh winston churchill called it the black dog um you know when you're and he referred to that as a black dog i mean the black dog was was barking at me pretty hard and i just i couldn't really i, I really couldn't wrap my hand around it. i mean matter of fact frank leo martin corboy my two partners one of the first two guys that said hey listen you know the factors you know this you can do this and uh we can put the money together um and i couldn't think of anything i mean i went you know that writers talk about writer's block i had cigar block in the sense that i couldn't think of a concept i, I mean i came off one of the most creative 
fucking teams in the history of this industry, if not the greatest sales team. And I don't say that to me. I say it to those guys like Brian McGee, Miguel showed out, Barry Bennett, uh, Steve Pesenda, God rest his soul, uh, Ed Trevino. Um, uh, I'm going to forget names and get kicked in the ass for this. Uh, uh, who, who, uh, Paul Spence. Um, for fuck's sake, I'm forgetting names, and, uh, and I'm sorry for those guys that I'm forgetting their names. But no, but, but a lot of industry greats, and some still, I mean, some are even more prominent today than they were at the time. And that's saying something because. Like you said, I, I look back on the end of I look back at the end of CAO and 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 the the rebirth that it's caused in so many iterations, right? And it it's it's so it it is staggering the amount of talent that you were around and in some cases even assembled. I know you're very you're quick to be humble about the fact that it wasn't about you, but I know you, I knew you had a hand in bringing some of those people in. And oh, I said yes. <laughs> you know, it's like. Uh, you, you know, also, you know, the, the, the thing about that is, you know, everybody thinks that John Huber is this uh, uber, like, creative guy and, and blend guy, you know, he's, he's much more than that. Um, Mike Condor, um, you know, from a business acumen, you know, it was, wow. And then, you know, you had Jono, you know, leading the orchestra at the top and, then, and Tim, who was a quick study, you know, uh, under his father, I mean, the you know, there's a, a, a great article that Dave Savona wrote in Scar Aficionado years ago. And, you know, I described them that they had a, a couple of different types of relationships. They had a boss subordinate relationship. They had a father son relationship and a brother relationship that all came out in our in our meetings. And that that dynamic was um, so, so amazing. So. It, 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 it was just a combination of everything and where we were going and what we were doing. And, you know, and Eileen, you know, coming in from a, a woman's point of view, which uh, was very prominent, you know, at, at then like the two most prominent women in the industry was Cynthia Fuente and Eileen Osgood. Um, um, you, you know, it, it's, um, you know, it's, you know we don't have the social media back then to go back and you can see that you can see it like through some of the print media. So yeah, it was, it, it was something in, you know, so you know, me leaving, you know, when I moved my family, when I say I moved my family, I moved the family and I, I took total responsibility of that. The moving from Philadelphia to, to Nashville and my wife said, okay, is this the best thing for our family? And I said, yes, it is. And we went there with never knowing when we were ever going to return to the Philadelphia area. Because I quickly became uh, not a Philadelphian. We, we say Delco here. Or actually, they say Delco. Yeah, let's get a hoagie, you know, and uh, sit on the stoop and drink a yingling. Um, <laughs> uh, uh, so that was, I mean, to the point where my youngest daughter, Molly, was born in Nashville. And she was born uh, November 2nd. And I remember saying to Kimmy, we're not going home for Christmas. Call your parents. We're going home for Thanksgiving. And I want Molly to be baptized in the same parish that her sisters were baptized in. So she at least has some kind of filly. Never knowing that we were ever going to re return. Figured she was going to grow up with a country accent and, you know, the whole or Nashville <laughs> accent. And, and Nashville is a very cosmopolitan city, as you know. It's yeah, um, it, it's a, it's an amazing city. Um, and then when I got walked, so CIO was purchased by Scandinavian Tobacco. And a year later, they formed and said, we're going to roll it into general. And just before they said that, I was walked and then everybody else was gone within a year. Uh, a couple of sales guys uh, got jobs uh, within the general organization. Um, but yeah, so, um, so yeah, it was, it, it was very, and I said to Kimmy, we're, 
moving back to the Philadelphia area, when I say, Kimmy, we're doing it, we're 50 50. Uh, uh, you know, sometimes when I say me, it, it, it's, a, it's a dominant statement on both of our decisions. You know, sure. I said, the best thing for me to do is go back, finish up my master's at Penn, which is in Philadelphia. And um, I'm going to go into the financial world, something I thought I was going to do for the longest time, you know, because I had a finance degree from Catholic. Right. It was uh, politics or politics or Wall Street was the were the choices back in the day. Yeah. And then politics part of there because I had the internships. Right. So mm -hmm. we and uh, we didn't talk about the various jobs. So that's a whole nother segment. That, that's kind of funny because um, that's back when you could get away with murder on Capitol Hill. It was uh, unbelievable time. So, uh, yeah. And so Frank and, you know, Mark, so let's do, I'm like, I can't think of anything. I also got to do, I got to get my family back on track. I got to get settled and get into, and I, and quite honestly, I think maybe I, I threw in the towel. There was no place for me to go uh, in the industry. And um, that was it. And, it, but it was always in the back of my mind. It was, uh, I want to, who, uh, Anthony Mazzola, I think was, was he there? Offered me a part-time job at Halts and, you know, you know, just everybody. Everybody was sweet. Everybody like, 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 what could you do to keep touching the industry? I didn't want to touch it. I didn't return calls. I didn't do anything. I was so, the black dog was chasing me so hard. Um, and I guess that's what I needed. You know, you know, there's a plan for everything. You know, there's, um, and uh, Lincoln and, and Peter Sims, who brought me in and took the time for me to get finish my licenses and uh, degrees, which was much harder than grad school, by the way. Uh, you know, you imagine taking exams again at fucking thirty eight years old, like in well, the seven, series yeah. seven. The series seven is no joke. So, yeah. Well, I, I why did you say I did six, sixty three, twenty? You, know, you name it. I, I took it and then designations AIF and all. You know, all these freaking things. I didn't even know what they meant. I just knew how to take a test. Um, which I didn't know how to do when I was younger, but um, yeah, so it was it was funny when I sold mutual funds, everybody asked me about cigars. Now that I sell cigars, everybody's asking me about mutual funds. <laughs> you get you can't you can't escape sometimes your former life, you know. I, I get asked about insurance all the time, I haven't sold insurance for five years now. Well, I worked for an insurance me. company, I was just on the what insurance were you with? I was for State Farm. Oh, okay. So yeah, I uh, Steve Bablasi. He's uh, he's our he's uh, well, I don't, I don't use State Farm, but he's one of my good friends, and uh, he's got a very thriving business here. And his Jeff Bablasi has another one, Delaware County. But yeah, so yeah, it's a whole different. That's a whole different. That's a whole different breed. Yeah. So so we okay. So we talked about the obviously the, the difficulty of leaving. The black dog chasing yeah. you. What was the moment? What was the moment you knew you were coming back? All right, it's happening. It's it's going to happen. It's done. It's a it's a signed deal in my mind. Um, I was still helping people do events or fundraisers or charity things. Uh, we we just talked about Kevin and Jenny. Um, with uh, the sport line, um, and I called one year. I called Rocky. Uh, I was either talking to Rocky or Nish. I said, "Listen, you know, because they would send me cigars. Like everybody was sending me cigars. As long as I've been out in the industry, I was still. I never really had to pay for it. Um, her clocks was sending me cigars. They're like." just just I, everybody was very generous about making sure i didn't pay for a cigar whatever and i had called and said listen i got this charity out and i i i need i i i i need it and literally i i don't want to pay for it i don't i can't afford it can you help me out yes and then i just all started this whole spark get back in the business get back in the business just talking to friends and then um i was doing it was a cigar event at my country club, Landark Country Club. 
Lanark Country Club in um, Havertown, where I live. I live right off the fifth hole. And they were doing a cigar dinner, and we had this guy, Tom Coyne, coming in. This He had just finished a book called, a uh, course called Scotland, uh, and needed cigars. And Huber was like, I, I don't want to hear anymore. Just tell me the number, and the different, what, what, what you need, blah, 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 and send them. And I, I remember even talking to Huber or Conger or both of them said, listen, because I know they were still like, if you need somebody to work part time on the weekends, cause just because I wanted to be around it. Yeah. Uh, let me know. They're like, no, our, our sales strategy is increased. You'll see stuff coming out, what we're doing. And so 2017, start talking to Rocky and go down to the, uh, go down to the factories and get back and then had a conversation, thought I was going to spend 18 down in the factories, couldn't get down there. The political climate was, was nuts. Uh, January and 19, I already started like a small project, which is a Solamente, which you talked about a little bit earlier and went down and um, had an interview. We went down to interview. <laughs> this is so fucked up. We go down to interview Rocky. We had 40, I had 40 questions. Uh, God knows how many questions fucking Frank had. So like, like we're going to go down and uh, we're going to walk in and we want these answers. We want these, we want these questions answered. Go in, walk into the room. And I think you've heard, heard this before. I know you have. Um, walk in and it's Rocky, Nish, Nimish, Mr. B, Dave Bullock, Hamlet sitting in the room and come in and Rocky's like, Miki. And I go, yeah. He goes, are you going to do what you did before? And I said, what does that mean? He goes, out on the streets, grinding it, doing this, doing that. And I go, yes. He goes, let me ask you something. Let me see the numbers. Let me see what you got in the tank, like money-wise. Well, let me see uh, I want to see your p and I want to see, well, we don't have a fucking p and We don't have cigars. Uh, we wanted to see our documents. You know, we said, uh, sign an NDA. I'm like, why are we signing an NDA? He goes, well, not, you know, not disclosure. He goes, this is to protect you, not me. You're like, we're not going to say anything. And it was just, um, and walk out. And we're going back to go check into the hotel. And uh, we're going to go meet him up at Burn for drinks later. We're on the way back, and Frank goes, did we interview them or they interview us? I go, we got interviewed. And he goes, who was the other two uh, manufacturers you wanted to work with? I'm like, uh, it, doesn't, it doesn't matter because this, this was the first I thought we, we didn't need to talk to the other two. And it was, it was, uh, it was pretty funny. So, so uh, long story short, none of those 40 questions got answered. I think they did kind of, but our, we didn't have time to write down notes because we were too many. We were too busy answering questions. Right. Well, I think that's. I, I, you know, I. You know, I, I think that's the. That's a really. That's a really enlightening story in a lot of ways because, you know, for you know for all the for all the positive accolades and they're all deserved. You know, Ro Rocky has has garnered a, a certain reputation in certain corners of this industry, for you know kind of moving at a hundred miles an hour, obviously. And, um, but I, I think that reputation- He's got a lot of regulators though that, that help him monitor that. Though, right, too, and, so. oh no, and that's what I was just about to say is that that, that, has come, that has come kind of full circle and been a lot more prominent in, year, in, the, in recent years with him is you can see that he's, I mean, he's still rocky without question, but he's, he's oh, yeah. slowed down in a lot of ways. And I think it's- it's really, it's really. That been, line is still racing, that. and shit is still coming, and ideas are still coming out. Oh of his yeah, head. like he literally, he's like Saint Augustine. Blah blah blah. You need like different people to journal his ideas. No, a hundred, no, hundred percent. And I think that's, I, but I, I think that's, like I said, I think it's a really great way to see him as his careers progressed, and then, you know, partnering with you or you partnering with him, however you guys characterize it as is kind of uh is, is an illustration of that you know i, I you know because i remember and I'm, as i'm sitting here i'm smoking both the saint francis is now really really enjoying it so it so 
let's go back to the uh, actually you know what we're gonna we're gonna stay with the St. Francis for now because I, I kind of want to work backwards here but before I do I want to get this thought out um, because I heard in a, in a recent interview uh, when someone was smoking your cigars and they were talking about how like oh this doesn't taste like a Rocky and you were very quick to say it's not a Rocky cigar and I, I think that is very perfectly placed because these four cigars that I've happened to enjoy with you tonight they are they are they're very they are very distinct and i think they have they, like you said they have that jalapa signature that you obviously love but they don't like rocky has like rocky has and a lot of other manufacturers have a signature about them but it lacks yeah. in that and that shows that that shows them allowing you to be you and i think that's a beautiful thing yeah and so also and to be honest with you, Rocky's blends are not as linear as people think they are, especially with the Tabacusa factory that we're working out of. You know, for instance, when I'm working on a blend, and, and Frank has been, he's starting to learn the tobaccos, he's starting to learn a, a lot of these things. He's like one of the quickest learners you'll ever meet. And, and it, it's very obvious, you know, his background you know, where that, why his mind works that way. But what, what's, what's important is that we have a Mika or a milk car, as people know him. You have uh, Gerber or Herber, as you would say, Castro, his, his cousin, um, you know, in the factory. And then you got Hamlet, you know, and we'll start working on, a, there's been blends that we're working on. And they're like, ah, that's getting too close to a Rocky. And I'm like, which one? <laughs> they won't tell me. And because I don't smoke enough Rockies anymore because I got to smoke my, because I smoke everybody's stuff. You know, I, I really do. Like you said, you nerd um, out on this stuff. Yeah. I mean, and, and I think that's what's helping this industry is everybody's a nerd, you know. And um, like I listen, I, you know, Rocky's booth at the end of every sales day and he's smoking somebody else's stuff. He's smoking his stuff. You know, it's, um, so that helps you because there's, there is one blend that we were really, they're like, nope. Because everything we make right now is in the Tabacusa factory. They're like, nope, you're getting too, like I said, all right, look, put this. And I had the pile and I pulled this over, getting ready to have somebody torse the door, like actually like free roll it without pressing it. And uh, he goes, nope, we're not going to do it. And I'm like, Okay, so it's, am I getting too close to something? They're like, yeah. So, back, you know, back to the drawing board. So, yeah, so yeah, but that's what's great. That's what helps us, you know, have our own style, you know, so yeah. So, um, so let, let's dive in here to some of these blends here. So, I, I like, I'll, I guess I'm going to work backwards. So, your, your latest release, you started with the Dedication. Um, and then you have the limited solamente that we mentioned, but we're right now I'm smoking, uh, I'm real smoking the St. Francis lines. We've got the uh, Ecuadorian Oscuro. Yep. And, and I hold this band up because you, unfortunately you got one that wasn't banded. So that's the St. Francis. And then the one, so you're smoking the St. Francis and you're smoking the Colorado. Right. Uh, and that. So the St. Francis wrapper is an Oscuro wrapper from uh, Habano Oscuro from Ecuador. Okay. The Colorado is a Habano, obviously a different priming, and it has a Colorado Rosado shade. Right. And that's what we refer to it. And another play on words, another story. Frank went to the Air Force Academy, which is in Colorado. Colorado Springs. Yeah. Oh, nice. Colorado. Nice. Yes. So that was a great because we're like, I, I, I've never been, I've broken so many fucking rules and th that that I established in my mind when we're doing our cigars. I'm never going to name a cigar after a wrapper. I'm never going to name a cigar after a shade. <laughs> yeah, blah, blah, blah. Uh, you know, here we are. And we have a Colorado, and we have a Habana, so, um, which I find is pretty funny. So breaking down this, uh, the the Ecuadorian Oscuro uh, with Habano seed, like you said, and there's Nicaraguan in the binders and fillers. You can definitely taste the sweet 
creaminess that comes from Jalapa. The wrapper is obviously giving it some creaminess too, but I'm getting this really nice distinct, like kind of I, I distinct leather note that I, um, that I love. I love this, the leather aroma and the taste. And it's funny, you mentioned uh, my interview with Klaus last week, we were talking about leather and, and he was like, you know, no one's ever tasted, no, no one really tastes leather. I was like, I was like, well, you know, if I, you have, ever, I have chewed on leather. Yeah, I was gonna say, if you've ever, if you ever played Little League as a kid, man, some, yeah. you know, we, we all chewed on our baseball gloves. So we all know what when you're pulling the strings on your baseball glove, you did. That's where you yeah. got leather, the, the strings, remember? Yeah, absolutely. No, I, I, um, I was teaching, or, or if you're out in right field and you're going, please don't fucking hit the ball over here. <laughs> yeah, you're chewing on, your, on your glove. <laughs> I, I was teaching my son how to, uh, to, with his mitt to to tighten some of it and that's exactly how i did it with my mouth and i was like uh you tie, I mean, tie, yeah, yeah exactly and he and uh he's and my son who's six he was like you put it yeah yep yeah, yeah, put it in your mouth and you, you pull it down and tighten it up and that's why you have a nice uh it, it adheres to your to your to your to your uh to your hand and uh but uh, as i digress there for a second but yeah no this this is a this is a i'm, I'm really really enjoying this St. Francis uh, with the Escuro wrapper. It is uh, tremendous. We're going to get to the Colorado here in a second. I'm, I'm doing them both at the same time. But um, the reason I encourage you to do that is because there are similarities in the blend. So sure. then I can taste it. Because yeah. I tell people to do it all the time. And like, oh, yeah, I'll do it. You won't get around to doing it. Like, I get it. You have other cigars you got to smoke. You got other people you're dealing with. So it was a great opportunity for me selfishly to ask you to do that. And thank yeah. you for, for, inter for letting me ask you to do that. Does that makes any sense. Well, you gave me the cigars, Mickey. So I think I'd be a fool to, to oblige you on a simple request, <laughs> you know, so, um, but no, well, I'm people, uh, people mean to oblige, but you know, other things get in the white family time and, you well, know, of course other. time, the, the ultimate killer, but, um, so when you, okay, so you're building, you're, you're building this brain, you're building all saints. So, you know, obviously it started with the dedication, which we're going to talk, talk about in a second. And then you take this next step with the St. Francis. What, what, what are you, what, and this may seem like a really obtuse question, but what are you and Frank building? What, what are, what's the, what's the, what's the vision of All Saints Cigars as we move forward and uh, presumably other brands, other blends will come forthright as you guys continue to, you know, build upon the foundation of su early success that you've have, what what's the vision? Well, well, thank you for saying early success. <laughs> so appreciate that. Um, my thing is is smoking a cigar and enjoying a cigar is is obviously important, and it's important to the people that that take the time to purchase our cigar, smoke our cigar, and, and pay attention to it. We want to be, you know what, you know, Collar and all these guys talk about big, hairy, audacious goals and all these things. And I'm going to be realistic. We want to be a horse in the stable. We want to be, when you go there, you're going to get your anchors. And one day we'll be an anchor. We really will. You know, how do you build an army? One soldier at a time. How, how do you eat an elephant? one bite at a time right so we know that's going to happen and we and we have a lot of friends that we are the anchor but you know that needs to get a little bit bigger we want to be when you go there you know what i gotta get one of those too so you go in and you know you, you buy that cigar or however you purchase it you know for us it's primarily retail uh if it's not retail it, it, it's one of our retailer friends that have um you know, an online presence and like, you know, what? I got to, I got to put that in the cart too, or I got to put that, in, you know, in, in the basket or, or whatever, or take that up to the register. That's what we want to be. We want to be a part of your portfolio, you know, mm -hmm. from a consumer standpoint. And one thing that it's very important to ours is, 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 uh, is, is it's three steps. It's really easy. We want to connect with the consumer with the respect of the conduit of how that cigar gets there at a fair and equitable price. And three, that you enjoy the process, you enjoy the cigar and enjoy the experience at, at, at a level that, you know, 
it's going to be a part of your portfolio or a horse in your stable. That's it. There's a lot of, that seems easy, but there's a lot to work to do there. And, and right. that's going out and, um, you know, building that and, and building that brand and building that experience. And that's, and that's what's fun for us. And, um, you know, we have a mild cigar that we're working on. We've, we've actually been done. It's just that it's just not going to get into the circuit until 2022. And quite mm -hmm. frankly, we have a lot of blends. We have a lot of names. Um, but we really went from zero to a hundred miles per hour. And with, you know, four lines or four blends out there. And with the fifth one, that's enough. We got to, we still have to get the dedication on the show. And then the St. Francis. And then, you know, talk about the Colorado and the Habano. They're going to come out in, in um, you know, in, in October. So, absolutely. So, so as you're, as you're kind of going back into the shops and we talked about your um, tremendous network and incredible relationships that you've built over the years, you know, and I, I, I remember this interview that you gave uh, for, uh, at uh, um, oh gosh, at Havana Phils, and uh, in oh Wilsboro. my lord, and so and he, you actually and, watch? Are you one of the five people that watched that one? Uh, I didn't watch it. I listened to it. I don't know how many people listened to it, but I listened to it. Um, <laughs> no, I'm well, kidding. I, I love no, Phil. Phil's a Phil's a great Phil's a great guy. I had the opportunity to spend some time with him at a uh, on a Davidoff trip a couple years ago and met his late father. Uh, oh, incredible. The best. The incredible best. incredible character um and it was so i was you know even though i just met him that one time and he, he passed just a few months later yeah um i was i was so saddened by that because i know that coop was really close with him and a lot of people that i i know in the industry really that i am particularly close with were, were close with him well as well and and that the, his death hit me in a weird way because i i I, I just think about the, the, the times that I could have had with him and the, the things that I could have learned from him. Um, and, you know, by proxy and, and a distance, I'm kind of learning from through his son now, which is really great. But yeah. the interview that you gave, it was funny uh, to talk about building. He said it was probably the, the quickest sale that you've ever had in the history of your career um, when you went into his store. Yeah. He but, posted on your thing. You know that, right? Yeah. Yeah. He, I was the first sale. Yeah, he was. Um, but, uh, what, you know, as you've gone into other shops and you've, uh, you know, you're reintroducing yourself and everything, what, what's been the, what's been the biggest surprise about going into some of your old haunts and visiting some old friends and you're talking about this latest project? What's when, what's been your, some of your biggest surprise? My biggest surprise. Um, uh, when my biggest surprise is how many people have said yes uh right away um i was flattered by that i mean obviously um people i know that said all right let me sit down let's smoke it it's a yes but let me let me see how i'm going to sell this yes and uh like wow the cigar the, the cigar is worthy of the yes uh, and i think that's been very that's been surprising and flattering um i think Biggest surprise. Um, it'll, it'll probably come to me. Well, let, me after we're done. Let, let me frame it this way, Mickey. And and I know I know your answer is coming from a place of sincerity, and and so is your humility. I have I have absolutely no doubt. So I'm not putting that into question. So let me contextualize my question, my follow up here. I, I know that's quite coming from a place of sincerity, but given given the amount of years and the dedication, not to be too punny. The dedication that you've put into this industry and, and into into this industry and into cigars and everything is it 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 really was a shock for you to to be so welcomed back it really was yeah you, you remember i was out for a couple of years so yeah of course yeah yeah but, so is um yeah um I, I, there was a couple of shocks where I, I, you know, I'll tell you, and um, I don't want to berate it too much is that a couple of people said no. And uh, that fucking pissed me off. I'm like, the, the, these are a couple of retailers that <clears throat> I've been over backwards for, um, helped them 
with extended terms when they were going through financial issues and stuff like that. And I was like, really? You know, um, and that, but there's plenty of people that are willing to, to bring us in and, mm-hmm. and learn it as a lesson. You're only as good as your last visit. And I've said it a million times. You're only as good as your last visit. I've heard you say you, that. And I, you know, and I always say, if you, if you, only been to one retail store you've only been to one retail store they're all different um so yeah so um yeah but that was a good kick in the ass like listen you gotta get out there you're gonna fucking work even a little bit harder do a little bit more research and and get in there and uh and do it so um yeah so but more positive than negative you know what you're gonna have both and that's the counterbalance of this uh of this industry so well, um, as, it, as it should be i mean i think you know i think the the relative you know like you said the early success that you've had and the relative ease from some of those of, of you know a plethora of those yeses even those those no's came as a as a kind of a hit um i think I really, I'm really liking this part of our conversation because I can tell that you're really focusing on those people who are taking a chance on you, and and, and those- you got to focus on the people that say yes. You got to get that shit back out the door. <laughs> Stop that shit. Sorry. You got to get those cigars back out the door and get them back in the door. Mm-hmm. So a no just means when you have time again, you address it again. Yeah, not now. yes means yes means you got the rope. Don't hang yourself with it. Yeah, you know, absolutely. you worked in retail. I mean, how many people have come in and told a great story? We, we were talking about a guy, Brahani, earlier. You know, how many people told a great story and came in and got all fired up? And the team in that retail store can't wait to sell that cigar. Yeah. And then what keeps them excited to keep selling that cigar until the next person comes in and, 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 and captivates them and tells that story? You're only as good as your last visit. And that's that's the guy that or girl that comes in and pulls a branch down so it's easy to grab that fruit. Are they grabbing your fruit or are you setting them up to grab the fruit from the person that's coming behind you and that 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 visit after you in that store? You know. So. Dr. Balance. No, I look, I've you 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 hit the nail on the head, Mickey. I've had my heart broken more than a couple of times in in, in industry because I've I've I, uh, I I bite down hard. I, I wear my heart on my sleeve, and and I'm I'm captivated by a story, as you know, just as much as the next person. Actually, more so than the next person, I would say. And and uh, I've unfortunately I've had my my heart broken a few times, and it, it and it's not because, it, and I, I will say this, I, it's only I, I can really I can count on my I can count on one hand, the times where the person was actually responsible for that disappointment. Other times it's stuff out of most people's control and it still doesn't make it hurt any less. It just, it's right. just disappointing, but I got to the show. I, I mean, I did. I mean, people that were early adopters, like Mickey, I haven't seen you. And I get what you're doing. What are you going to do to get back in? And I'm like, you're absolutely right. So is that a good problem to have? Yes. It's a good problem to have, but it's still a problem. <laughs> you know what I mean? So, um, from, and so gave us a nice, healthy, uh, order. When I say healthy, ordering a lot is not healthy. Ordering the right amount is, is healthy. Mm-hmm. You know, get in so you can get in and support that. So, and so, that's, that's where we're at, where the apex and the axis are kind of crossing over each other. Mm-hmm. And now we, you know, that's where we have plans of where we're going to bring in some of the right people uh, to help us support us out in the field from a sales organization standpoint. And we can't wait to take that out and let you guys know about that. We're in conversations with a couple uh, territories right now, uh, not for direct, but, you know, w- with brokers um, mm-hmm. that I think will um, bring a lot of excitement to our brand. So well, that's great news. Um so let's take a step back and let's talk about the the foundation that you laid. So let, let's talk about this this exercise that you exercise and journey that you've had me explore tonight with the rail smoking of both lines. So um, so I have to say, you can already see from my perspective. Okay, so this is just my opinion. You can already I can already see the building upon that you've done because if I worked backwards, I can say that my my 
least favorite, and that's not to say that I didn't enjoy it, but I can honestly say that my least favorite was the original uh, Dedication. Um, I loved the- The one that got all the awards, I love it. <laughs> I lo- yeah, but but like I said, it's not, the, it's, it's not because I thought it was poor, I really enjoyed right. it, but I could see where how you're building upon, like I said, this is very early on and we're talking about building upon early success. I right. can see the story that you're building with these with these cigars, and um, I've I've enjoyed the Saint Francis lines more than the Dedication. I enjoyed the Habano a little bit more than the original, and these two Saint Saint Francis cigars that I'm smoking right now are just they are fan fucking tastic, Maggie. They are really good. They are really good, and I'm really having a hard time deciding which one I like more of the Saint Francis. But this right. is this is this is dynamite absolutely dynamite i mean well it's uh frank had a lot to do with that blend so a lot to do with that blend yeah i you know obviously i put the uh put the blends together and he fought for him and i wasn't fine i'm like yeah okay We're like we gotta get the medium we gotta get the, we, we gotta get this medium strength out there we gotta do this he's like nah, 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 nah. and the response has been absolutely tremendous so well so i for think that, for that medium plus medium plus plus guy it's a full. I, I I think it's uh it's it's on there, and I think uh and I hope it's gonna get a, get a ton of accolades over the next you know couple months or whatever. Wherever everybody's got a different cycle of how they analyze it. You know, we always say like, who gives a shit about a, a score until you get a good one? Like when the dedication got a ninety-one from Half Wheel. Like, oh okay, maybe we'll start talking about the, we'll talk about the ninety-one we got from it. You know, that's a that's a tough nut to crack. Like yeah. I mean, they're they they are, they are tough. They are we were, actually tough. We were just so lucky that they actually, in the first year of our company, that they actually took a look at our cigar. And um, the other thing I could think of is maybe if I had some time in the industry, they I was able to get into their into their loop. So. Well, you and I actually talked about this offline. Where um, you know you, you're your cigars are catching fire because of a lot of people, a lot of, you know, a lot of people I would say of, I guess, particular and we'll just call it picky tastes yeah, have really enjoyed what you're putting together. And it's easy to see uh, from, from tonight's exercise um, because I mean, like I said, I've really enjoyed it. Like I said, like just because the original was my least favorite of the four tonight doesn't make it a poor cigar. In fact, I've really enjoyed it. In fact, I'm really yeah, we talked about it earlier. Yeah. I'm excited to go back. Yeah, I'm excited to go back to it. Um, I really am. It's excited to go back to it and it, it just in and, and enjoy it by itself singular singularly. Um, but I've really enjoyed this exercise because I, 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 you're right, uh, Mickey. I haven't. I, I, I don't do this. Um, um, and, I, I told you this. I'm gonna drive you crazy. I have to take. I have to take a break. No problem. That's fine. So and then we'll come back. Can you give? Can you give a bronze and a silver and a gold to to the the four cigars you've had tonight? Okay, I'll, I'll try. I'll I'll really try. The St. Francis is giving me a run for my money. I'm, I'm I'm going back, but yeah, we'll do that. So while you take a quick break here, uh, let me just kind of walk walk my audience through uh, tonight's exercise. So what uh, what Mickey asked me to do, and I've obliged him, is uh, he gave me four cigars at this year's trade show, and uh, we're going to talk about the trade show a little bit to conclude our evening here in just a few minutes. But um, he gave me four cigars. He gave me the original original dedication uh, with the San Andreas wrapper. Um, the, the dedication with the Ecuador and Habano wrapper, which, uh, the, the binder and filler were a little bit tweaked. So they're very similar to the original blend, but different. Um, and then the St. Francis lines, the, uh, Colorado and, um, the Ecuador and Escuro. And, uh, I've, like I was telling Mickey a few moments ago, the, um, this exercise has proven that he is, that all saints has continued to build upon the early foundation that they've set. And he was he was quick to say like how the the original dedication was the one that, even though it was so far as my least favorite of the four, um, was the one that got a lot of accol- early accolade from you know Half Wheel and some other folks who in the industry who who thought it was a tremendous cigar, and it is it's a very good cigar I've really enjoyed it, um, and but I really enjoyed the Ecuadorian Habano and the the two San Francisces have been fantastic, um, so I think I'm gonna I'm keep I'm keep smoking here. He asked me to give a uh, a gold and a bronze and a silver out, uh, and I'm going to do it. 
Uh, I think I've got it. I think I've got it nailed. Uh, and as he makes his return, but, uh, um, but that is um, that this is, this is going to be tough. I got to say, this is going to be tough, but um, just to do a quick recap on tonight's show, if you were tuning in earlier, um, we did our, we did our, ch- our, our, our typical charity segment in which my guest spotlights their, um, their, uh, a charity of their choosing. And, uh, we did two tonight. So we did the family support line for Mickey and we did St. Jude's Children's Hospital for Frank Leo, his partner in All Saints Cigars. Two amazing organizations. Uh, the links will be in the show notes, but you can check out St. Jude anywhere. Um, they're all over the internet, um, but a great organization. But you can also check out Family Support Line at familysupportline.org. There's a great do- donate button. If you feel, feel moved to donate, I really encourage it. I also have that link in the chat as well and uh really encourage you to donate to two some fantastic organizations so i'm going to continue to smoke here and as mickey comes back but i think i got my gold my silver and my bronze lined up pretty easily and i think it's gonna be pretty predictable considering what i was stating earlier about him building upon his foundation here but i'm really um really interested to hear from our audience if they've had a chance to smoke some of all saints cigars yet uh, i know a couple of are just on the shelves the solamente was a limited series that they did and that's almost done as he was saying uh we didn't i didn't smoke that cigar tonight but we've got the uh, the four cigars the dedication uh the dedication uh habano and the two saint francis cigars gordon Narscuro and the colorado so uh, Mickey's back now, and, and he's put me on the spot. So he wants me to choose a gold, a silver, and a bronze in the spirit of the Olympic fever that has captured and remember every four years. Remember for me to send you uh, some solmentes. I will. Okay. Well, thank you very much. That's very generous, Mickey. Um, all right. So you put me on the spot here. So I got a gold, a silver, and a bronze. Now, I have to say the – and I think it's pretty obvious considering what I was talking about with building on upon a foundation. So let's start at the – let's start with the bronze. And the bronze goes to the Dedication Habano. Um, and uh, I, I really enjoyed it um, as well. And I really enjoyed all four. I'm not blowing smoke at you, Mickey. I really, I really would, I would, it would hurt me and would pay me, but I would be honest with you if I didn't like any of these. Um, and, but I really, I really did enjoy all four. I really did. Uh, the, but the, uh, the Habano from the Dedication, um, what I really liked about it was that the Jalapa sweetness that really came through really balanced with that spiciness of that Habano wrapper really well. And there was a tremendous amount of balance um, in that particular cigar. Not that it was lacking in the original Dedication. I thought that cigar had a lot of nuance to it. Um, and it might just be my palate today, but I was looking for, I was looking for a little more oomph and that Dedication Habano definitely delivered upon that. So that's my bronze. So I'm smoking the St. Francis here. I'm go- I was going back and forth. This was the toughest one, the gold and the silver. And um, I, I, I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about my palate as of late. I've, yeah, I'm I've, curious I've, on that, yeah. So lately I've been smoking, I've, uh, you know, 10 years ago, I mean, you couldn't give me a cigar strong enough. I loved heavy-bodied, full-bodied, full-flavored cigars. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a big fan. Have always been a big fan of La Florida Minicana. I love that that delivered, full-bodied flavor and everything. But as a, as my palate's developed, I've really enjoyed more nuanced, even milder, full-flavored cigars that really captiv- captivate the palate in a del- in a in a good way. Right. So so. Lately, I would say I'm just more in the middle. I really enjoyed medium, medium to full cigars and, and that I can enjoy any period of time. I don't have to prep myself. I don't have to like eat a rich meal to balance it or anything like that. Uh, you know, I can, I can enjoy cigars like this. And that's something I could say about all four of these cigars because I can enjoy any of these at any time of day, um, which for me is, is, a, is, a great, is a great compliment to have. You talked about having that, 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 uh, that anchor right? You're, you're yeah. running those anchor, like any of these four, four cigars could be an anchor in my rotation because I know if I go to it, it's going to deliver a great experience, no matter if it's late in the evening, if it's the middle of the afternoon, or even if I'm starting my day with it. So um, that being said, um, my silver has to go to the Colorado. Um, 
I think that it uh, it kind of builds upon the 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 dedication Habano quite a bit. Uh, there is uh, a really nice caramel sweetness that's really rich in my mind that kind of comes through with it. Um, beautiful spice that complements it. You get that uh, again. That jalapa sweetness is kind of there. Um, really enjoyed it. Um, but the gold um, is this oscuro man. I am I am digging i am digging this cigar it is fantastic it's what you're smoking right now yeah. i'm digging this cigar it is it is gorgeous the talk about a second for the wrap the wrapper is flawless there is almost no tooth there's no vein there's almost and the, the oils aren't even that prominent either it's just a gorgeous well the oils always get better with age so true oils. True. Okay. That's, that's, that's a fair point, but it is just a beautiful cigar and the box press really, really makes it even more clean appearance. Um, oh man, I'm, it is, it is a beautiful looking cigar and it smokes phenomenal as well. I'm really enjoying this. I love it. Thank so, you. Yeah, so that's my gold, my silver and my bronze. Um, but like I said, I'm really, I'm really excited to go back to the original dedication uh, singular, singularly just to kind of experience that and uh and get a a full appreciation for it i have a feeling though because you brought up a good point about age i have a feeling that these four could easily kind of shift in rank you know as time goes by for me personally i don't know um, I, I don't know how it is for you yeah what i would say is it'd be a while for if your palate was the same a year from now 18 months from now, even two years, you would probably rank them the same. That's fair. Okay. All right. You know, so, um, yeah. So, you know, a lot of people talk about don't, don't age out a cigar, smoke them if you got them, you know, it, it's, it, it's good to have them, you know, super geek and all that stuff. But at a certain point, they're like wines. Remember we're talking about stuff that comes from soil, uh, Terra, you know that terra as they say in um in, in the wine community uh it, it's important like drink it or smoke it before it's it, they're not like whiskeys and other things you know it's even like some beers like you know smoke it before it goes you know because they will they will get blander over time you know at a certain point there's an apex and everything you know yeah so. certain cigars definitely peak I, you know, I've done enough age experimentation uh, with cigars over time where I've noticed, noticed serious, serious drop offs in cigars that like, I just, I really don't know. And there's, I mean, those are some, those are some prominent cigars. What, I mean, one of the ones that I always kind of go back to when you talk about aging and ones that I do not age because they do not age well, they really drop off in flavor, especially in intensity. And they'll be quick to even back you up on this, uh, quick to back me up on this statement. It's Drew Estate. Yeah, absolutely. John, Jonathan's always, I, I, mean, I mean, Jonathan and I go back a long ways and, um, and, you know, he, he got to market on a, obviously a different concept of cigar. And then the Liga that obviously, um, is great. So notoriety that, uh, Saka was involved with and obviously, uh, Nick, uh, Maleo, um, you give the credit to wherever, you know, whatever. And I don't think there's any politics in that, that, you know, one gives credit to the other, the other one gives credit to the other. Um, yeah, he was always, you know, Jonathan was always a fan of all cigars. He, he, you know, he found he found some that, that, that took it and, and, he, and he rode with it. So, yeah, I mean, that that's, um, some cigars are made to, to, they're all different. It, it depends on the combination that you put Sure, in sure. So again, let's focus on most uh, on uh, my, I guess my last, my last question, my second to last question of the evening here, Mickey was, uh, you know, the recent events was the, the 2021 PCA trade show, which was All Saints first trade show. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you know, we were, uh, we were fortunate enough to come by the booth and I was, uh, you know, had the pleasure of meeting you for the first time and interviewed you. Um, but it was, uh, it was a busy, it was a busy week for all Saints cigars. Every time we went by, I knew you were talking to somebody. Um, so I know that, uh, it was a, it was a, it seemed like a very successful week for you. How would you characterize, uh, the PCA trade show for all Saints cigars? Well, I think, I think one of the biggest things that, 
uh, one of the reasons I think it was we had such a successful show was the uh, the um, everything we did with the booth. I mean, we put so much money and time and investment. <laughs> <laughs> can't even get Coop, it out. Of the I thing. know you, Coop. Uh, <laughs> you know, uh, <laughs> obviously, I'm joking. Um, yeah, we did. We had a lot of fun in that, and, you know. But um, it w- was very exciting, and um, you know, coming from a background with these big boombastic booths that you know I, I've always been a part of and been so proud of, you know, with Davidoff and and, and Cao and, and and those things. Um, it was it was it was humbling and, and, and exciting to see how many people came by our booth to talk to us, uh, whether it was the media or uh, um, retailers. And one of the things that was really great to see is retailers that I'm friends with that hadn't seen in a while. Mickey, great to see you back. Let's talk. Let's smoke the cigar. Let's do this. Uh, and then like, hey, so and so sent me over here. So, so you got to get the cigar, and that was, uh, that that was very humbling. We're really excited, and it was, um, it was funny to see, looking at the numbers, and um, and when I say numbers, I, I do look like how many cigars did you sell? What was the price? What you know? What's the cogs? What's what, what's the to me, the amount of targeted retailers, because you have to have a plan. Come on, mm-hmm. you know, it's business at the end of the day. Uh, of targeted retailers that came over, uh, how many targeted retailers that I didn't have a relationship with that have grown to a place that you want to be, that you know that are going to represent your brand well when you walk out of there um, was absolutely, it was, it, it was very exciting for us. So. So, um, are you are you able to divulge like how many accounts you were able to open? Uh, yeah, um, quite a bit. So I, I don't have the exact numbers, and um, though if I did, I probably wouldn't tell you anyways. Um, I, you know, I know, I know. Like, so for instance, reading Coop's some of Coop's stuff, he said, "Oh yeah, everybody reports good numbers." I will tell you, I've heard that forever. Right. Uh, and when I was in the business before, we always got better every year. Um, for us, it was our best show ever. <laughs> for you, that's <laughs> actually accurate and not bullshit. Yeah. So, and then, like, I'll you take can, it. Um, in listening to other brand owners and account and whatever I know without getting their numbers and the way they described it, I believe them. So I, I don't believe when, when somebody said they had the best year or the, it was a very good year or, or it exceeded 2019, uh, I believe it. Uh, and, and that's just not me being uh, a proponent for the industry and for other manufacturers. Because as you know, we all get along for the most part during the day or at night, you know, nine to five, fuck you. I want that shelf space. At 501, <laughs> we all have a cigar and a beer. And, you know, as you know, working in retail like I did, uh, you know, the best example of being a good retailer is when you have three or four competitors in your lounge or in your store at closing hours because they're all horse training cigars in the parking lot and hanging out in your place, which, may, which retailers love because that just goes to show the strength of that retailer. Um, yeah, I believe it. So, and talking to some of my retailer friends, like I went in, I was going to spend X amount of dollars. I spent 20 to 30% over what I had budgeted. And I've heard that in the years past, but you hear that again this year, um, was, was, uh, was exciting to me because the industry is healthy. You know, the, those politics, um, uh, you know, we made a commitment to CRA. I, it didn't get to me about being in that picture. Like they asked me to be in that picture, but I didn't know they had asked me to be in a picture. <laughs> um, almost thank God, because I probably would have posted what I was told to post. <laughs> so, um, 
Um, so sidestep to sidestep to landmine. You didn't even know. It. Yeah. So yeah, well, it was good for us. Uh, I think they should have said, reached out to the media a little bit more. I I, I do agree with that. Um, at least for the fact for the exposure, but get all those people that one picture was amazing. So it really, it really, yeah. At the at the heart of it, that that picture was very was very powerful. What, it was, what the intent was, I thought, was very good. Um, slapping the big four, um, you know, I don't know. Um, that's not my route, you know. Was, again, let's talk about the positives. So. Yeah, you know, like the age-old, you know, mantra, Mickey. You know, the the road to hell is paved with good intentions. You know, but I mean, at the right. end of the at the end of the day, to turn about a phrase, right? The end of the day, that that to me, I I take away the positive of that image, and that was a very powerful photo, to see so many, so many again, like you said, from nine to five. You know, you guys want that shelf space, and you guys are competitors like anything else. But right. I love this. I love this industry for that for that for that for that moment because you know at the end of the day you know you've got people hugging each other that are fighting out for, fighting each other out for that shelf space and that's you know that's a great but it's thing. always been it's always been that way i mean even though with uh, you know the eight or so years that i had off even though i, I wasn't visible in the industry but i was still observing what was going on um that has never changed you know um and i, and I think that's what's healthy and we need and i think with uh today's media um it, and what you guys are doing and the new media um such astute learners and, and um I, I i think it's fabulous and we need that to for this i mean for me as you know the family like for me i i, I never thought you know i came from a family of entrepreneurs and business guys and you know and they always thought I would be the one that would be the first one to do it. Well, it only took me until I was 50 years old to actually do it, you know? <laughs> so, um, yeah, I mean, we're all in. So, I mean, my whole family, uh, everything that has happened to us and the good fortunes that I had selling mutual funds is all in, in this business. I mean, when I say everything, I mean everything. Well, so there's, no, there's no plan B. Well, and I know that your I know your family has been huge supporters of this. I know from the very beginning, you know, you've talked about how you know Kim Kim is 100 percent behind you, but also your you know your young girls, you know they yeah. they're they're really excited, excited for you. And yeah. I heard you say in another interview just like how they're you know I think you were talking about um, I think you were talking about Tierney specifically mm -hmm. and how. Um, she mentioned how happy you were and how, and she could see that. And I think, I think your entire family can see that. And I, I think that's very evident when you, when you hear you in interviews or like I was fortunate enough to see you on the trade show floor, you can see the joy that, that this, that brings you and, and, and you feel, you know, I, I didn't know you when you were selling mutual funds, but I, I, I'd wager a good amount of money that matters to me that, that, uh, that you were more happy in those four or five days on the trade show floor than you have been in years. Cause you were, you were oh, felt at yeah. home. Oh yeah. I mean, I was just ecstatic. My partner was like, this is what I thought a trade show would be with you. You know, it, it was, um, we had my, our other partner, um, Martin Quarterboy, his father-in-law, uh, Milan was out there. Milan, uh, was out there. His buddy, Joe, and we had uh, Todd. We called him St. Todd. He's actually an investor in the company. Uh, we have a really neat investor model. Well, it's, it's done. You can't invest in the company anymore. But uh, it's a very, we call it the, the, the Tom Sawyer um, concept. But um, it's, uh, you know, yeah, they were all excited. And, and when I was giving updates to my wife and my kids, so they were my, my my three daughters are so ecstatic that i'm back in the business so and like dad's not as grumpy anymore <laughs> you know so well uh mutual funds were great once a month yeah you know, <laughs> but 48 hours later like uh i gotta fucking back to back to the grind yeah. yeah no but i think one of the most beautiful moments that i witnessed was actually not on the trade show floor it was i was you know i you know i saw as i was i was perusing i was collecting photos for our ad that we were running for tonight's show and 
I, I saw one that I didn't include it in the ad because I thought it was too personal, but um, but I I I was very struck by it. Um, and it, you know, as a father myself, it, it it brought a tear near tear to my eye when you you had that picture of you lighting up with your daughter Tierney. I think it was at her recent graduation, right? And you guys were yeah. at some All Saints. Yes. So <laughs> it's a tradition, I guess, in a lot of places here uh, in the Philadelphia area, and it started with a. Uh, St. Joe's Prep, the all boys schools is they smoke a cigar like right on campus after graduation, which blows my mind. That's cool. Uh, and the all girls schools are doing it, and all the schools are doing it. And uh, we, and I'm like, no, 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 Tierney, we got to go over here. And, she, and her girlfriends were doing it too. So, and then the dads were like, and then a couple of girls were like, Tierney, can you light my cigar for me? So I would cut the cigar, and I'm like, I'm not going to light it and give it to one. You know, that, that, that's not, not that's, that's borderline creep, creepy, right? So Tierney was actually cutting and lighting their cigars. Her boyfriend, who rose for prep, she had to cut and light their cigars when she went to their graduation and hand off, you know, in the midst of COVID, too. That's even freaking even more hilarious. And then there's one picture, and then uh, I guess my daughter, Molly, who's going to be a freshman um, in, in high school, she took the picture. She's six one, by the way. Plays basketball. So my two oldest are rowers, uh, and Kearney's getting ready to uh, go to LaSalle, and she's going to row for LaSalle, which we're very excited about. It's only a half hour away. That's awesome. Uh, and so we lit the cigar. We were sharing the same thing, and then my youngest daughter uh, caught it, and so uh, they all take a puff here and there. We, well, we don't talk about it. You know, we don't want to get in too much trouble. But yeah, that oh, that beautiful picture, moment. Yeah, thank you. Beautiful moment. Well, Mickey, I, I really appreciate the last couple hours that you've given me and, and give, in my audience uh, regaling some of the stories uh, over the years and some of the most recent ones and everything. So wanted to, to conclude tonight's show with our, our, our always curveball segment. This is oh, a uh, this is a it, no, this is a, curveballs. <laughs> this is a, this is a fun exercise as well. And so as always, our uh, our curveball segment is always brought to you by Dunbarton Tobacco and Trust. Fastballs oh, no, are no shit. Freaking Dave and, and Saka. All right, here we go. Fastballs are curveballs. It doesn't matter since the company's in session. Steve Saka has been knocking them out of the park six consecutive years in the consensus top three. Yep, I looked it up and even got fact checked by Mr. William Cooper himself. So uh, tonight's tonight's curveball question for you, Mickey. So we've been talking a lot about names tonight. We're talking about a lot about the dedication. We talked about St. Francis. We even our our uh, our one must go we even featured some names as well. And uh, this uh, this show we didn't even get into, and we'll get into it next time. But the uh, the, the tolas and the dedication, uh, and which I'm really interested to talk to you about as well in our next visit. Um, but you have worked for three very esteemed companies before All Saints. Davidoff, CAO, and even a small stint with Philippe Gregorio. So if Davidoff, CAO, or Philippe Gregorio gave you a chance, okay, to take a name from their portfolio, here, Mickey, you can have it. What would you take? What would be the first one that comes say, to say mind? Say the question again. I'm, I'm, I'm stalling. Say, if, say D, if Davidoff, CAO, and Philippe Gregorio said, Mickey, thank you for all your years of service. We appreciate you so much. As a gift to All Saints Cigars, we're going to let you have a cigar name that you can take and now use for All Saints. Which name would you take? What's the first one that comes to mind? Doesn't have, there has, doesn't have to be an order. We're not saying you prefer Davidoff over CAO or vice versa, or even Philippe Gregorio. We're not saying that. That's not, we're not trying to pit anybody here. All I'm asking is if there's a name that they could give you, which one would you take for All Saints Cigars? It would have to be the, can I give you my top three? You sure, um, you could you could answer it however you want. So it would be top three would be not in any particular order. Gold from CAO. Okay. 
Great name. Uh, Avo Domain. Oh, it's my jam. Love that cigar. Uh, well, it was just Domain. Mm-hmm. And Griffin. Ooh, nice. Okay. Yeah. From so, from Davidoff. Okay. And the story behind Griffin and the story behind Domain is they're both fucking amazing. Yeah. Um, and the story behind Gold is the most amazing story of all the three of them. But that, right. That's an offline story. No worries. <laughs> so, okay. So Gold, Domain, and Griffin's are make up your top three in no particular order. We're not about hurt feelings yeah. on the show. So wonderful, wonderful. Well, Mickey, thank you so much. So what a great, what a great, uh, what a great show this has been. A great conversation. I'm looking forward to having you back on the show because there's so much, so much we left on the table because you have such a, a rich and storied history. Uh, and I look forward to our next conversation and uh, really appreciate your time tonight. So thank you so much. Uh, uh, thank you. And I don't know if you're going to ask, but you, you've asked like a couple. Of, like where we're at right now is the best way to go is to go to allsaintscigars.com. So mm-hmm. it's allsaintscigars.com. Uh, I have a couple other appearances I'm doing. I'm going to be out in the field. Uh, I will be out in uh, Colorado uh, for the Rocky Mountains uh, Festival. So oh, nice. On the 28th. And um, other updates you can find on um, either social media or our, our boy over at Ash Daily. Uh, so Chris, Chris, Carl, Chris is amazing. Uh, what a sweetest guy. I, I tell you what, he dropped off those macadamia nut chocolate things on our booth. And that was like the lifesaver for us. So he's amazing. Yeah, Chris, is, Chris does an incredible job uh, with his brand. And, and uh, so excited, uh, so excited to see what uh, the next, the next steps are for all saints. Great great early success and you're it's it's this is only the beginning so this is so exciting Mickey. really excited and to the, have you on and the world needs more bear hugs the it's world true. needs more bear, bear hugs absolutely couldn't agree more can't wait to give you another one mickey so right. to our audience out there thanks for tuning in, uh, tuning in tonight really appreciate all your likes shares and comments continue those coming on if you are a fan of the show, be sure you go to our Facebook page, Alosa Fumar, and like the page. You can check out a calendar of upcoming events there, as well as our YouTube page under the same name, Alosa Fumar. You can hit the subscribe button. Or if you're listening to the show later on, where the, wherever you listen to podcasts, you can always find us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Play, Podbean, or wherever you listen to podcasts. For sure, again, that you hit that download, subscribe, and review button. And if you already are a subscriber, do me a favor. Hit unsubscribe. Just don't forget to hit resubscribe because that really helps my numbers and allows me to get great phenomenal guests like my guest this evening, Mr. Mickey Pegg. So for everyone out there, this was our 178th take live from the Alec Bradley Lone Star Studios of Euless, Texas. I'm your host, Barry Duplissy, as always. And guess what, everybody? We'll see you next time.